Uh, recording is on, but uh, uh, we, 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 we have recording from other time too. Right? So, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ned Mohan. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Minnesota. And it's my pleasure to host uh, this uh, webinar with, on a very timely topic with, uh, with, uh, given by a very capable speaker. And I'm assisted by two PhD students, Dan Kelly and uh, Jaram. So if anything goes wrong in this webinar, I'm blaming them. <laughs> Just no, no, nothing is gonna go wrong. So let me uh, share my screen here uh, first uh, to show you a few things. So I'll share screen and uh, share here and uh, double click here. All right, and uh, so why doesn't it go into the presentation mode? Okay, there we are, there we are in the presentation mode. So this is the wrong slide that I'm showing you. So I very quickly <laughs> get rid of this. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, I'll close this here and start a different one, which is case webinar. Okay, there we go, there we go. So this is the right slide. So <clears throat> the topic of today's webinar is integrating uh, distributed uh, energy resources with the grid technology interconnection and supporting practices by Patrick Dalton. And here's the beautiful picture of our campus where the Mississippi goes right through it. And we are on the East Bank and then there's the West Bank also. We are not in the Middle East, by the way. This is West Bank, but not in the Middle East. Okay, just making a silly joke here. So uh, just a little bit of propaganda that uh, we have this uh, consortium of uh, University for Sustainable Power, CUSP, and we are developing courses as part of this uh, uh, consortium. And you can, the URL is very simple. If you just type in CUSP and UMN uh, in Google or whatever their browser is, so you should get there. And you can see uh, this uh, website of ours. And it has been joined by 235 US universities uh, as members, and it has uh, the, uh, the total about 450 or more faculty members. Yeah. So we have developed 17 senior level and graduate level courses. Uh, you know, they are equivalent to 54 credits. So they are listed here in these uh, four areas. And, uh, you know, all the material for these courses, for example, uh, lecture videos and all those things are on this website and they can be, uh, you know, they are free to download, okay. And then we are also developing electric labs uh, funded by Office of Naval Research. And these are very low cost labs. So for example, here's a lab for electric drives, uh, which is complete, which we have been offering for now uh, some, for some time. And then we have a digitally controlled power electronics lab which is under test, but should be available fairly soon. And then we are going to go to this power system simulation lab. So these are uh, our activities and uh, you, I hope you can make use of some of these as you see fit. So with that, actually I shouldn't have closed that, but that's okay. Maybe I will put that up back on here. Okay, so here, so here is, uh, a little very brief bio of our speaker, uh, Patrick Dalton. So Patrick Dalton is currently a manager of distributed energy resources at ICF. In this role, he focuses on supporting clients in developing solutions to address DER impacts in utility planning and operations across the US. Uh, Patrick has 11 years of distribution engineering experience at Excel Energy where he most recently led a team responsible for DER integration. <clears throat> he supported drafting of the recently approved Minnesota statewide interconnection process and technical standards. He's an active member of industry standards working groups related to DER interconnection, interoperability, and uh, energy storage, including IEEE 
1547, 2018, and other, uh, 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 you know, other uh, task force, I would say, our standard, standards. Uh, Patrick participated in efforts to address <coughs> impacts of DER on the bulk electric system, uh, including the NERC system planning impacts from DER, uh, working group, and MISO guidelines. Development of uh, for a DER IEEE 1547 implementation. He is a licensed professional engineer in Minnesota. Patrick recently joined the University of St. Thomas in an adjunct faculty role. But one of the important things in this bio is not mentioned that Patrick is a graduate of University of Minnesota. Very proud for us, proud thing for us to say. And then he is also very popular as this uh, webinar indicates, uh, the limit uh, of this webinar is 500, and we hit the limit, so it's a sold out event. So as I mentioned to you before, that it's, uh, uh, you know, all the participants are muted, but uh, you can certainly ask uh, questions to the chat box, and Patrick would kindly then respond to your questions, uh, you know, during or after the break. So with that, Patrick, I will turn it over to you and to do that, uh, maybe I have to do nothing. You just have to uh, go for it. So is that the way it goes? Yes, I think um, if Dan, you could assist uh, with changing the screen sharing, I think we'll be all set to go. Uh, and uh, thank you, so Professor Mohan, for that. Professor, if you just stop sharing, then that's it on the top okay on the top stop sharing okay yeah, there that's you go. It. yeah yeah thank you thank you okay and then i see um host disabled participant screen sharing so i'm wondering if um there's a if that could be enabled for me so so jaram or dan any suggestions there uh there. I, I enabled you now yeah Perfect. Thank you. Can you see my my screen now? Yeah, I, we can. We can. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Mohan, for that introduction and for the opportunity to be here today. I, I would like to just uh, say a few words quickly about the University of Minnesota and some of the work that uh, Professor Mohan is is doing um, to help kind of develop a future workforce in our our industry and and uh, future research as as well. I, through some of my, my other work, I've just seen that that's really an emerging need and something that isn't all that common across the, the country. So we're really fortunate here in, in Minnesota um, to have, have leaders like Professor Mohan that are really advancing the, the industry and, and helping develop the, the future uh, generation to, to continue to, to work on, on these, these issues. So I want to thank him and the University of, of Minnesota for that. And yeah, thank you, Patrick. Absolutely. And I would also like to to thank a, a number of other supporting members that um, allowed and supported the, the development of, of this material. And I have them listed up on the screen. So in addition to the, the University of Minnesota Center for Electric and Energy, there are a, a few other um, members that, that supported this effort. Um, I have a few framing slides here that I'd like to go over just in terms of what our discussion is going to be about and then we'll we'll do a deep dive in into the material and I welcome questions through the chat box at any time so please feel free to send those if I, I see them while we're on a slide I may try to address them there otherwise if we have a lot of questions coming in I'll plan to address them after each break so we'll we'll go for roughly an hour at a time and then and then take a break um it, it's a little bit flexible how much material we get through i have the core here and then there's extra at the end so depending on if there's interest in particular topics i'm really happy to dive into those if it looks like it's of broad interest to the group so what we're going to be talking about today in terms of distributed energy resources are sources of electric power connected to the distribution system. 
And there are a number of definitions of DER out in the industry. Some folks include controllable loads, uh, energy efficiency. Uh, those definitely have an important role to play in the grid, but I'm taking the approach of the standards IEEE definition of DER, which is distributed generation and, and distributed storage. Further, we're going to really limit the scope of, of that type of DER to technical aspects. So again, I want to recognize the importance of policy, market, regulatory drivers in how and when DER is deployed, and also even the, the technology itself of what's required to be installed um, can originate from a regulatory process or a policy related process and the market really determines what's offered for capabilities. A lot of this is driven by by standards, which is central to our discussion, but we're really going to try to keep this tightly focused on the, the technical aspects of, of DER integration. And in, in doing so, we're, we're going to spend most of the time looking at standard requirements and the underlying technology capabilities and a little bit on analysis tools and techniques for, for grid in, impacts. And then just briefly, we'll, we'll touch on some of the planning, operations, and emerging use cases. But most of what we're going to focus on is sort of the bottom of the, the iceberg that, that we're looking at on the screen. In terms of an agenda, we're going to start with a brief overview of the technologies, just a slide on, on each of the basic technologies. I'd like to discuss how the different characteristics really drive different grid impacts and, and different capabilities. And then most of our time is going to be spent on the DER capabilities and functions that originate from the standard IEEE 1547 2018. And then we will talk some about DER impacts and analysis, and then just a, a brief amount of time if, if there is left after questions on planning for DER, operational considerations, and emerging topics. So with that, let's jump right into the, the technology here. Inverters are really becoming the dominant type of interface for DER. This is largely driven by solar becoming a, a very large part of, of the grid, but also wind energy, even at the bulk system level, is um, moving to back-to-back -back power converters or, or basically an inverter type of, of technology. So understanding uh, how inverters interface with the grid is, is becoming more, more critical for, for the folks that plan and, and operate the grid. So inverters are, are really, they act as a current source on the grid. And, and what I mean by that is that they're, and this is grid coupled inverters or grid interactive inverters, which are separate from those um, designed for islanded systems. But uh, thinking about interconnections and integration, these, these grid interfaced inverters really follow the grid. So they're a current source that is, are injecting power or current into the, the grid aligned with the voltage waveform that they're, they're sensing. They're very flexible devices in that they can completely decouple the real and reactive power components. So in terms of providing uh, voltage support or reactive power, there's a lot of flexibility since those two quantities of, of power are, are really decoupled in the, the controls. And they have really two Two primary control, control loops that I'll, I'll mention here. There's the, the DC side, very fast inner control loop, it's sometimes called to, to regulate the, the DC source. And then the grid interfaced control loop is a little bit slower and that, that regulates 
current flowing onto the, the grid. Um, typically using a pulse width modulation to create the waveform, which is what's shown down in the, the bottom right hand side of, of the screen. Um, let me get a pen out here. So here's the, the pulse width modulation. And then I, I mentioned that it's grid following and there's a phase locked loop typically here that's measuring the grid voltage and current and really locking into that in a control loop sense in order to align the current output with the grid voltage and, and frequency waveform, the, the voltage waveform aligned with the, the grid frequency. So moving on to synchronous machines, a, a technology that's been with us for a, a very long time. Um, you know, these are mechanical devices using magnetic fields either generated by a permanent magnet or a, a DC source on the, the rotor. And then um, the, the movement of that, that magnetic field in relationship to, to coils, you know, really generates electricity, the, the magnetic flux translated. Um, the, the reactive power is controlled by the excitation field here. So the, the voltage applied to the excitation field can cause the machine to either inject reactive power or absorb reactive power. And in terms of, of DER synchronous machines, they're relatively few and far between, but I, I have seen um, and worked on interconnections for like run of the, the river hydro generators that are, are relatively small. So it is a technology that we see on the, the DER side. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about a, a comparison uh, between the technologies in a few slides here, but I, I sort of see inverters and synchronous machines as kind of endpoints in terms of being the most different uh, for real and reactive power control and fault current response. And then in induction generators are are basically an induction motor that are driven above the synchronous speed, so above the the frequency of the the grid essentially, uh, depending on the number of poles, you know that frequency is actually much much quicker. The the angular speed is much much quicker than than the actual grid frequency. But that's that's really the the basic concept here. Something that's different about induction generators is that they do require an external source of reactive power which plays into some of the protection considerations like uh, the ability for one of these machines to start up without a grid source. That, that's more difficult for an induction generator when compared to a synchronous machine. So we'll talk a little bit about that when we get in, into impacts. Um, one of the, the technologies or the types of DER that commonly used induction generators or form of induction generators uh, was wind turbines. I think that they're slowly moving to be fully power electronics and inverter coupled is sort of a trend I've, I've been seeing, but uh, going back 10 years or so when there were a lot of small wind turbines being connected in, in Minnesota on farms and rural areas, there, there were a number of these uh, doubly fed induction generators, sometimes at the one, two megawatt type of, of scale. And then finally, would like to briefly mention a few things about energy storage. There are a lot of different types of technologies that have different characteristics in terms of capacity and discharge time. Um, a lot of the storage conversation is currently dominated by lithium ion battery technology, which has a lot to do with the maturity of that market driven by consumer electronics and electric vehicles. Uh, just the, the technology is, is very mature and the manufacturing 
capability across the, the globe is, is pretty high for lithium ion. So it, it is a, a technology that's being um, deployed a lot in terms of distributed and bulk scale storage. But I expect this to change over time as other technologies emerge for specific use cases. And especially as we, we look at needing longer duration storage, which is really an important aspect of the energy transition, um, it's likely other technologies will, will emerge. And then also wanted to mention that the battery energy storage controls are a little bit more involved than a standard inverter. There's a battery management system that's really controlling the state of charge, making sure that it's, it's safe. Um, since storage technology has some risks, it's a little bit, it, it can be volatile if not maintained and operated under the correct environmental conditions. Uh, it's really important to have these, these management systems as, as part of the, the um, overall energy management system for storage. And there, there is a draft guide through IEEE that's currently being developed. And it's expected to help clarify a number of, of aspects of DER integration related to storage, whereas the, the base standard I'll be calling IEEE 1547 2018, that just didn't, didn't get into many details about storage. So um, let's see. Saw a number of items. Okay, yeah. The uh, energy storage state of, of charge is, is one other thing I'd like to mention. And then I saw some questions or comments coming in. So I'll take a look at those and before we move on past the, the technology. But the, the energy storage state of, of charge is really an important aspect from the, the grid operator viewpoint. And what we're finding out through these IEEE discussions is how much of an abstraction really the um, state of charge or available capacity is from a grid operator standpoint. So what, what we see on the right here is, is the operational system from a grid operating standpoint, you wanna know, you know potentially your maximum state of charge and your minimum state of charge. So you have an idea of what's in that, that storage unit. But what might be even more important is the available energy in the system, which is related to the state of charge, but it, it depends on a number of other factors like discharge rate and, and temperature among others. So both this operational system state of charge and these other important parameters are, are actually modeled and they're often proprietary models that are vendor specific which are, are taking the, the physical measurements, and there's a number of different ways to physically measure the, the state of, of charge, and, and they're modeling the, the operational outputs. So one of the outcomes that we expect from the standards guide, IEEE 1547.9, is to clarify items such as this so that folks that are responsible for planning and, and operating the grid or installing um, DER systems, developing DER systems, have a common under, understanding and, and view on, on how these are operated. And then finally, on the, the technology side, I'd like to just mention the differences in impacts between the, the technologies when we think about interconnecting or integrating to a distribution grid. Rotating machines, due to their mechanically coupled behavior and responses have a, a much higher fault current when com compared to inverters. And that response is really defined by the machine itself and the magnetic fields and the, you know, the, the physical, um, the, the momentum of, of the, the rotor, kind of all of these physical mechanical quantities. Whereas the inverter response is largely driven by software. And so it's, it's very flexible, but it also means that there are a, a much wider variety of responses and especially looking at like fault current or short circuit 
current how a system behaves when there's a problem on the grid. Uh, inverters have a very wide, wide range compared to uh, rotating machines. We talked a little bit about the, the ability to sustain islands with inverters being a, a grid following type of DER and, and rotating machines being more of a grid forming type of, of DER. And then also the, the range of uh, reactive power capabilities. We, we spent a little bit of, of time uh, talking about that already. So that is it on the, um, on the cap of just the basic uh, technologies. And I'm looking, a couple of questions came in um, on low voltage ride through, frequency ride through, um, system inertia. And so these are, these are items that we will get into a little bit further in, into the presentation. So thank, thank you very much for asking those questions. They're, they're certainly on topic and we will uh, try to get to them. So where, where we will actually talk about those is the second module, the bulk system support that's, that's mentioned on the, the screen. But first we're going to get in into the local system support. So um, local system is really distribution here. Uh, medium voltage, you know, typically 35 kV and, and below types of systems, whereas the bulk system is transmission, generation, higher voltage, typically above 100 kV, um, going by the, the NERC definition, I, I believe, or NERC definition. And um, there's also bulk plant sizes that are, are considered within that bulk system. And then finally, we'll talk about interoperability. And the, the lens that we're going to talk about all of these topics is through IEEE 1547. So we'll start with just a little bit of general information about 1547 before getting in, into those three modules, but that's sort of the, the focus here of the next hour or so. Um, so, so first, what is, what is IEEE 1547 and, and what is the scope? Um, really, what, what is, um, what is in, in scope here is that all distribution connected energy resources are, are in scope. There's no size limit like there was in the past, but there is an exception for uh, backup or standby generation. So if it's paralleled for a very brief amount of time, less than 100 milliseconds, which uh, typically a standby generator upon a, maybe like a hospital or some sort of building that has a backup system as it returns to the grid, there you don't want to have a blink. So there's some sort of parallel time when the generation system is operating at the same time as the grid these standby generators are, are exempt. Um, one of the, the big, big changes of this standard is that now this communication interface is in scope. So the, the power interface, which was typically referred to just as inner connection, um, has always been in, in scope, but now there's two interfaces that, that are the focus of, of the, the standard. And it, it starts to involve a little bit more of the DER itself, uh, more than in the previous version from 2003. One of the important new concepts in 1547 that we'll talk about is this performance category framework which defines performance categories or required capabilities and, and functions is really what a, a performance category is. It's, it's a, a required set of capabilities and, and functions, both in normal operations, so when everything is operating correctly, steady state, sunny day, no problems on the, the grid, perhaps just trying to regulate um, normal voltage, um, normal voltage excursions or, or deviations or maintain voltage within the band is, is probably a better way to put it. 
but but also there's performance categories for abnormal conditions. So when there's a fault on the grid, uh, a voltage event, a frequency event, um, low voltage ride through, frequency ride through are, are functions that are required. And so we'll notice for normal performance categories, there are A and B. Uh, B is more capable and typically associated with inverters. And for abnormal, there's one, two, and three. Three is the most capable as well. Um, typically, what's been done across the country is inverters are either assigned category two or three, so 2B or, or 3B, and synchronous machines are, are 1A. And, and that's similar to what um, Minnesota has, has done as well. It's probably worth mentioning, so, so why have this ab abstraction when we know what the DER technologies are? And that's really just part of how IEEE makes standards. It's a, a technology neutral approach, which is, is core to the standards making process. So that's really where these originated from. And then just to define, so we, we define that there are normal functions and, and abnormal functions. And so we need to also define what is what are the conditions that characterize normal behavior. Um, and it's really voltage and frequency based voltage between point zero point eight eight and one point one per unit is what's considered normal voltage. So that, that's uh that's a wider band than ANSI C eighty four dot one range A displayed below, which is central to how the limits or thresholds that utilities use for maintaining voltage, often they're required to by, by regulation maintain voltage within that range. So DER is considering a wider range of both voltage and frequency to mark normal conditions. And then abnormal is, is simply um, anything that's really out, outside of that voltage and frequency that, that we were just looking at. So I saw a couple more questions come in. Um, first one, in the scope of IEEE 1547, how do you differentiate between utility scale? Um, there, there really isn't a, a, a definition within 1547. It's anything that's connected to the distribution system, and it doesn't even really define what distribution system voltages are it it uses this this concept of um the the local area electric power system and and i think that it's just pretty well under understood that that's the low uh voltage side of substations so anything on low voltage side medium voltage distribution network is is considered in scope and, and everything else is, is out of out of scope. Um, another question on temperature effect on battery state of charge and state of, of health. It's a really good question. I, I don't know that we have the time to, to get into those uh, details here. Um, so if, if we do have time at a break or something, I, I would really like to, to get into that a little further. So we'll, um, we'll keep keep going here. And for the latest question that just came in on category B, which is, is very topical for where we're, we're going, um, was a question on if category B is, is used by inverters. And, and it, it typically, inverters will typically be category B because they're capable of, of meeting all of these requirements. But it, it's up to the inverter manufacturer what they wanna specify their equipment to and certify it to, and it's up to utilities and authorities having jurisdiction to decide what they're they're calling for. So there's sort of those two pieces in determining it, but inverters definitely meet this category B, which from a reactive power capability viewpoint requires the ability to inject or absorb 
reactive power at 44% of the apparent power nameplate. What that translates to is about a, a plus or minus 0.9 power factor. And it, it has sort of this little slope down from 20% uh, rated active power down to 5%. So I should mention that you know this requirement for the 0.9 power factor is really above 20% active power. As we get below that, um, it slopes down to avoid a step change in reactive power when a DER is going above and below that 0 0.2 per unit active power rating. And we'll notice that it, it's, it's symmetrical here in terms of injecting and absorbing reactive power, which is different than category A, which has the same requirement for injecting reactive power, but has a lesser requirement for absorbing reactive power. And this goes back to the, the fundamental capabilities of especially synchronous machines to absorb reactive power uh, and the heating that's caused by that typically. So it's rotating machines just don't have quite the same capability without making design changes and and so that's the reason that category A has a different reactive power capability when compared to uh, category B. So getting in, into another concept that's really central throughout the rest of the, the standard is this reference point of applicability. And why this is important is this is the point on the system that all of the interconnection and interoperability requirements apply. So it's the point that you're testing these requirements to. Um, it's where when you're, you're modeling impacts, it's where you're expecting the response to be seen. And there are, are two different points. It's either the point of DR connection, the POC, or the point of common coupling. And we see in the, the diagram, the point of, of DR connection is really the, the terminals of the device, the DER device. And the point of common coupling is the interface with the grid. Um, so what, what we're, we're looking at here on the point of common coupling is this is typically like a utility meter. Um, this is maybe a better example. The area EPS is the standard term for the distribution system. And the point of common coupling is between the local or customer system and the, the utility system. There's a, a decision tree that, that feeds in to the RPA determination and it's shown up on the screen. This is a simplification of, of what's contained in the standard, but it does include all of, all of the, the elements. So the, the main factors that determine whether the reference point of applicability is the POC or the PCC are related to the, the aggregate nameplate of the DER and also the average load demand of the DER, which there's a footnote in the standard that average load demand is defined by the utility um, because this isn't really a, a well-defined concept in the, the industry, what average load demand is. So it's a little bit nebulous in, in that regard, but it does provide a signpost for um, determining the reference point of applicability and then there's there's also uh, export limitation, and then zero con zero sequence continuity, which is important for protective functions like the ability to detect a ground fault. Um, you need zero sequence continuity. So, if you have zero sequence continuity and it's a smaller system or the export is prevented, that looks a lot like perhaps a rooftop solar PV system 
and the reference point of applicability would then be the point of DR connection or the, the DER terminals. If it's a larger unit or there's a lot of load on, on site, so there's commingled load and generation, um, or excuse me, the, the commingled is the point of DR connection. If it's a large generator without load commingled, so it's a, a fairly small amount of load, it starts to look almost like a dedicated power production facility like a generator, sometimes called you know, front of the meter, but kind of a standalone, maybe larger generator that's sole purpose is to inject power into the grid or that's the primary purpose. Then this reference point of applicability ends up being the interface between the customer and the, the utility system or the electric grid. And, and that's, needed for larger systems because you want that predictable response right at that grid interface. Whereas for smaller systems, it might be swamped by load that may not make a, a lot of sense. I should mention that um, there's, there's a couple nuances here in the middle. I won't go over those in detail, except to mention that mutual agreement between the DER customer and the utility can be used to select a point basically anywhere for where the RPA is. Related to the, the RPA in some ways is this concept about applicable voltage that needs to be measured. So you have a point where all of the requirements apply, but then there also needs to be bounds around what's actually measured at that point. So all of these advanced functions that we're going to talk about, both in terms of local voltage system support and low voltage ride through, high voltage ride through frequency um, on, a, on a different side, we're focusing on voltage here, but these advanced functions are, are sensing grid conditions and responding accordingly. And so we wanna be very clear about what is being measured. And, and that's what this applicable voltage requirement is within the standard. So displaying it on the screen for reference, won't go over each of, of these, but just to mention that that has been standardized. And it's important because uh, like ride through types of, of functions are required to use the lowest voltage. And then it's defined that for a three phase four wire service that you're measuring both phase to phase and, and phase to, to neutral. So it, it's just defining exactly how these are going to respond by including what's being measured. And then also related to the what's being measured is, is how, how accurately these quantities are, are being measured. And so this is a new uh, aspect that was introduced in IEEE 1547 2018 to require certain measurement and calculation accuracy for both steady state and transient conditions. I would just, just point out um, without going into individual numbers that look at the, the types of, of numbers that, that are included, a, a plus minus 5% for active power and reactive power. I mean, we're, we're not talking about super accurate responses here. And for distribution and, and DER, that's, that's probably okay. Uh, the distribution system is, is fairly messy and oftentimes um, we're, we're shooting for a fairly broad target when we're, we're looking at analysis on the distribution system, which is very different from like system protection or, or transmission system. Um, analysis, which is a little bit more deterministic and, and precise. So I, I think that in general, this type of accuracy is aligned with uh, how the distribution system is, is operated and, and analyzed, but it, it is not super accurate. And, and it's just worth pointing, pointing that out. One other general concept uh, before we get into individual functions again is that if, if we have all of these different functions, there needs to be some sort of hierarchy on how they respond, which function takes precedent over the rest of the, the functions, essentially. And 
what we're looking at here really is that hierarchy where the the most the function that takes precedent over all others is this one called disable permit service and that will trip uh online der so if a der is generating power it will cause it to cease to to energize the system and trip offline um, and if a der is not operating it will prevent it from coming online if this this function or this point is is toggled after that are some of the protective um, types of functions like tripping for faults open phase voltage or frequency excursions and then then after that if if you weren't supposed to trip if you were actually supposed to ride ride through then then ride through voltage and frequency are the the next highest then after that are are basically all of the the more local support types of functions which in some ways are our grid optimization features so helping control the voltage a little bit and they're not as much related to the fundamental kind of safety and protection of of the system as some of these higher order functions are or functions that are higher on the list i should say uh, Another change, so we're, we're ticking through some of the, the big changes in this standard in case you were familiar with the, the previous standard from 2003, which maybe could have mentioned at the onset, the level of complexity in this standard has gone up by maybe an order of magnitude where the 2003 version of, of the standard was around 20 pages or so. And you know, looking at content, it was probably a dozen pages or less if you take out some of the informative information and are just focusing on normative language. Well, this 1547-2018 greatly expanded that and now we're up to around 100 pages and, and a lot more dense content. And one of the, the additional concepts that was introduced was this cease to energize state. And what it is, is it's, it's inclusive of tripping. Tripping used to be the, the concept that we would solely talk about when thinking about a device that was supposed to no longer produce power because there was some sort of condition that warranted that behavior. Well, what's changed now is there's a cease to energize state that does not necessarily imply disconnection, isolation, or, or tripping. It, it could be in an inverter, like a gating function, where the, the um, power electronic devices in there uh, stop allowing power to pass through, but the inverter itself, that phase lock loop that we were looking at, is still synchronizing with the grid. So it could be able to come back online fairly quickly because it's still sensing grid voltage and it's synchronized, but it, it stopped producing power. And that's very different than a tripping state, which typically involved uh, what was sometimes referred to as galvanic separation or basically an air gap within a device, whether it be a switch or more typically a breaker of, of some sort. That That's actually changing now. Um, and in the ceased energized state, there is, since it's the device is still connected to the grid or the DER system is still connected to the grid, there is allowed a uh, limited exchange of, of reactive power and also uh, house power or auxiliary loads can charge. Within this, this larger concept of cease to energize, is momentary cessation, which I, I mentioned that an inverter that hasn't tripped, that entered a ceased energized state could still be synchronized with the grid. And the reason why that's important is that this momentary cessation and restore output function, it's called, is a very rapid response compared to what we were used to in the past, which was essentially a five minute return to service response. This momentary cessation and restore output requires that 80% of the pre-disturbance active power level be restored within 0.4 seconds. And that's intended to help 
support the bulk power system, we'll look at in low voltage ride through where this concept comes into play. That's really the primary place that it, it uh, is introduced in, into the standard, but it does allow um, for grid operators to have this function that could potentially support grid stability and, and reliability. So kind of putting together all of those, those pieces, the c standardized response includes both tripping and momentary cessation. Starting with tripping, which is the, the concept that many of us are, are probably more familiar with if we've been working with the DER for some time, uh, uh, the, the device trips and then there is a five minute delay is the, the default. So we're looking at um, the functional response. We have a 300 second delay. What's new about this standard now is there's, there's a default ramp time of 300 seconds or five minutes as well. Both of these are adjustable within this range in the, in the right-hand column. Um, but there's, there's sort of thinking about the potential grid impacts of a large number of systems suddenly coming back online after five minutes and what that can do to voltage regulation or um, mostly voltage regulation. There could be thermal impacts, but that, that would happen over time. We wanna have a smoother reconnect. So a ramp rate that's either linear or stepwise linear is really what's expected. Except if it's a small DER unit, a randomized delay can be used instead of that ramp time. So if, if we think about a neighborhood that has hundreds of rooftop solar systems and think about the aggregate response of those systems coming back online with randomized delay, it would look a lot like potentially a stepwise linear function. And so that's, that's helpful for the, the grid. Momentary cessation, we just talked about, and that's that very quick restore output, 80% in um, less than, than half a second. So that's the general information. I, I saw a number of questions come in. I will try to respond to a few here. Um, and then perhaps it might be time to take a quick five minute break. So the, the first question was any time duration limit to say, okay, there, there's a question about the duration of a voltage or frequency excursion to consider it abnormal. And from the, the standpoint of, of what was defined normal and abnormal, there, there really isn't, but what's important and what, what does include a time element is the, the ride through responses. So that will define if you're in that abnormal region, the duration, particular durations or boundaries of durations where specific responses are, are required. So that's, that's something that, that will we'll look at as we get into the, the frequency and voltage ride through responses. Um, question on the difference of DER with load versus dedicated uh, power generation and the, the issues like open phase, anti-islanding, testing, operational, issues, grounding transformers, other protective devices. Um, it's, it's a good question. I like to understand what angle to address this one from. There's, there's a lot there. I guess I, I would say that the, the difference between DER with load and dedicated power generation is going to often affect that reference point of applicability either being at the grid interface or the, the DER device or system interface. And, and that will affect how the system's required to respond um, to certain, certain events. Um, 
But in, in terms of like open phase anti-islanding, those are requirements of, of all DER. They're required to detect and, and respond to those those types of, of conditions. So I, I'm not sure that that entirely answers the scope, but if there were kind of specific parts of that, I'd be happy to go into a little bit further detail. Um, next question was current scope are the two interfaces that, that we discussed, but independent system operator performance requires additional communications between the DER transmission system ISO RTO. Uh, the question is, is that out of scope? And it it is basically any anything upstream of that that interface right at the DER or the DER system is out of scope. And we'll we'll talk about more what that means from an interoperability perspective when we get to that that section, but communications to transmission systems, ISO, RTO is isn't isn't really defined, but what is defined is that interoperability interface that would allow for that flow of, of information. So they're they're connected, but it it's not um, it's not really part of the scope of 1547. And then another question about difference between momentary cessation and fault ride through. We'll cover that when we get to the ride through section. Um, and then finally, how is response times in weak grids? That is a, a, a very large topic in its, itself. I guess what I'll say about weak grids is that Typically, voltage and frequency excursions are more common, so DER needs to be configured to uh, be able to handle those excursions and stay online if, if that's the, the intent. So islanded systems are, are um, an example of, of weak grids where you would take that type of approach of needing to change the, the settings for the the DER to be able to, to operate in, in the, the weak grid. Um, just a couple more questions here. I think we'll take maybe two or three more and then take a quick five minute break and then um, return to the local system support. So uh, there's a question about how can the post fault recovery performance of inverter systems be improved due to low inertia? And we'll talk a little bit about this related to fast frequency response. The inertial response is slightly different than fast frequency, but we will we will get to that a little bit later. Um, then there's a question: Do we do we have a stability problem in the distribution network from from DER? I typically think of stability as more of a bulk system transmission type of issue, but DER could contribute to bulk system instability if large amounts tripped offline in aggregate at once. So that that's sort of the link between DER and system stability. But in terms of like how we think about power system stability in in general, um, the distribution network doesn't doesn't really have a, a stability problem, so to speak. And then the the final question here um, that I, I see on the, the screen is, is there a classification between controllable and non-controllable DER? There, there isn't because with the recent standard update, all DER is required to be controllable through that interoperability interface. So that um, distinction or classification doesn't doesn't really apply to to DER. And with that, I see we've been going for roughly an hour here. I'll suggest that we take a, a quick um, five minute break and be back. I'll, I'll be back at uh, by nine thirty five central time here. So thank you for all of the, the great 
questions, please keep them coming and we will return to talk about local system support such as volt var, volt watt uh, functions and why they're needed and how they're applied here in about five minutes. So thanks and uh, we'll be right back. system support aspects of IEEE 1547. So starting with a little bit of, of motivation on, on why do we even need local system support functions, specifically thinking about voltage support. Typically a, a feeder, a distribution feeder that doesn't have any DER on it will exhibit this type of declining voltage profile that we're seeing on the, the bottom of the screen. So near near the substation here, voltage is, is near the, the upper range allowed. And then due to current flow across impedance near the tail end of the line, if there is no DG, you might be getting down to the, the lower range. So this is kind of fundamental to, to power engineering and Ohm's law that this is uh, a, a feeder profile, voltage profile that, that you might, might expect. If we add a, a generator at the tail end of the line that injects power in the reverse direction from um, the normal flow, what happens there is voltage is, is raised by the generator location due to that current flowing across an impedance now in the, the other direction. So it's the same physics essentially, but it's just now that we've added a source near the tail end, we can have high voltage. And there are really from the, the DER perspective, only two different ways that the, the DER could reduce the voltage. The first one, is to consume reactive power. So maybe we have a, a capacitor bank here near the substation and VARs from that capacitor bank are, are flowing into the, the generator and that reactive power flow across the impedance has an effect of lowering the voltage. That's the preferred approach and what's typically looked at during interconnection studies. The alternate approach is to reduce the amount of, of active power or, or watts that the, the DER is generating. And so this, this would be in an interconnection study, really the, the last resort is to curtail the, the total amount of, of power that or capacity, nameplate capacity essentially, that, that the generator could interconnect at. Or this can be used on a dynamic basis that we'll be looking at for emergency conditions in, in, set, in the, the volt watt function. Active and, and reactive power control capabilities are defined by the, the standard and there are really five of 
these constant power factor has been with us for a long time. Um, going back 10 years doing wind integration studies on distribution, this was a, a common specification that would come out of our, our analysis. Constant reactive power is new. What that essentially is, is commanding a fixed level of reactive power. I haven't seen a whole lot of use cases for that yet in the literature, but I could imagine with more advanced systems like distributed energy resource management systems or even ADMS, that perhaps this could be incorporated into volt var optimization schemes. So schemes that utilities use to control voltage and minimize losses. Potentially there's a future use case for that. But a lot of the focus has been on these, these last two functions here in terms of reactive power control at least. And that's um, volt var and to a lesser degree watt, watt var. But I, I would say primarily volt var is the focus. And we'll look at exactly what these volt var functions are. And then in terms of, of active power control, so voltage and reactive power control means that either you're, you're just controlling reactive power based on a, a set point, that would be these first two, they're not sensing any grid conditions. And then these, these latter two are sensing conditions, volt bar is sensing grid voltage and responding with reactive power accordingly and watt var is sensing DER output or measuring DER output and then adjusting bars accordingly. On the other hand, this active power function volt watt is measuring voltage from the grid, but instead of adjusting bars, it's, it's adjusting the, the power output. So if we think about autonomous functions and what we just talked about on the previous slide of the, the two ways that DER can manage voltage, you know, this is, this is the first way controlling bars based on the, the voltage, and this is the, the second. So these are, are really the, the two active autonomous functions that, that interact with the, the grid. Digging into the, the specific details of the volt var function, what we're looking at on the left is sometimes referred to as the volt var characteristic curve. We have reactive power on the y axis and voltage on the x axis. There's a, a dead band in the middle here that's centered around a reference point voltage. So whatever you're actively trying to maintain voltage at would, would be the reference point voltage. And then there is a dead band, a region of voltage excursions or deviations, a range of voltages where this function takes no action. And dead bands are pretty common in control systems to contribute to stability. Uh, if we think about you know, a, a cruise control system, in your car, there, there's a dead band on that as, as well of a range of speeds where it's taking no action. Otherwise you would have potentially a very kind of um, jerky ride if that control system was constantly trying to adjust for every, every minor movement and speed. And so that, that's a similar concept for the, the volt bar function. When you are outside of that band and especially getting on the high voltage side, uh, thinking back to our example of DER raising voltage near the tail end of the feeder, this function starts to increase the amount of reactive power that's absorbed by the DER. So the DER is taking VARs from somewhere else on the system and syncing them and in doing so pulling that reactive power across the impedance and lowering the voltage, just as, as we were, were speaking about. Um, so absorbing bars lowers the voltage, injecting bars raises the voltage. So there is this left-hand side with V1, Q1 up here that potentially voltage could be, be raised. Um, there's a question if volt var is, is more effective with or without the dead band. I think a dead band is, is really necessary because of those um, control stability issues. 
And then there's a question about volt watt control, and I'll get to that when we get to the that slide. So still focusing on a volt var response. Looking on the, the left hand side, top left hand side here, uh, there's a theoretical feeder loading profile. So maybe load is going down in the middle of the night and, and going up in the day. That's that's what this top left hand is. The voltage on the feeder, if we're discounting the effect of voltage regulation devices like load tap changers, voltage regulators, capacitor banks, is going to be somewhat of an inverse of, of the loading. So during heavy loads, or during light loads, excuse me, like right here, you have high, high voltage. Heavy loads, lower, lower voltage. That's, that's pretty typical. And so uh, there's a little animation here that I'm going to walk through, starting with the, the voltage, excuse me, the, yeah, the voltage going up. Let's do this one more time. <laughs> Sorry for that. I, I should explain what's going to happen first on this full far op operation curve. We're sitting in the middle of the dead band right now where, where voltage is, but as voltage starts to, to go up right here, the volt bar curve is going to go down, down this side. So that's really what we're just looking at here is to try to demonstrate that this really is a dynamic function that's going to be moving along that characteristic curve and injecting or absorbing VARs accordingly. Moving on to the, the watt VAR function, we're looking at the characteristic curve here on the bottom of the screen with reactive power on the y-axis and active power on the x-axis here. And I, I sort of view this as just a kind of a little bit more refined power factor control in that this, this part of the, the characteristic curve is essentially what a, a power factor would look like, that it's a, it's a constant slope value based on the active power generation. So reactive power is essentially a linear function with relationship to active power, but what what this function actually does is it creates a dead band. So there's the, the potential or the, the ability um, to have a, a dead band and make more efficient use of, of VARs. And the way that this might be used is a study could uncover that there's a certain active power that starts to result in an overvoltage and a known amount of reactive power that would be required to mitigate that over voltage. Here's a, a fixed power factor approach that there'll be reactive power at any amount of, of generation. But this, this new function might say, well, we don't really need reactive power in this region at all. And so we, we can instead use this VATWAR function. It has a dead band. That's one potential use for it. I do tend to think that volt bar is going to be the dominant function, but uh, engineers like to have a number of different tools in their, their toolbox because there are so many different ways to design voltage regulation schemes that I could see folks coming up with a, a really intelligent way to use this, this function. So then moving on to volt watt, what we're looking at here is active power on the, the y-axis here, voltage on the, the x-axis. So for voltage that's up to some normal level represented by, by V1, I shouldn't exactly say normal, but some threshold, which as a default is 1.06 per unit. So slightly above that ANSI um, CD4.1 voltage range that we were talking about, which utilities typically adhere to in terms of voltage control. Up to, to a limit that's slightly higher than that, uh, the DER 
operates at the, the rated, rated power. And there's no issue, but if, if the voltage does exceed that level, it starts to do almost like a soft shutdown of cur curtailing the, the active power down to some either minimum level or 20% of, of the, the active power. So this is really intended to be a backup type of function since the, the default is above typical allowed voltage and the range of allowable settings doesn't allow you to get within normal voltage. Um, it, it, it's really pointed to be like a backup type of function. And one example of, of how this could be used is where there's automation or any sort of system reconfiguration that's needed. So looking at on the right hand side of the screen, we have a DER, it's connected to this top substation alpha. Normally red breakers are closed. So the, the top substation is energizing the DER and up to this green open recloser. And there's a, a different substation that's tied together. And this is very common to have distribution field ties for flexibility to operate the, the system. So thinking back to our voltage impact slide, a DER that's near the substation, there's not as much line for that active power or impedance for that active power to go across and potentially raise the voltage. So much lower chance of having high voltage when the, the DER is close to the substation, given if the conductor is large enough and a number of other items, but that, that's a bit of a simplification. Well, let, let's assume that we lose that substation at the top. Substation alpha is hit by, by lightning and it, it trips out or there's a transmission fault and it, it trips out. In automation, scheme could recognize, okay, my problem is at the substation, this top breaker opens up and then this tie breaker just closed in. So now what we have is this substation Bravo is energizing the, the line up to the DER, the DER after a five minute delay, like we talked about um, in that, that tripping state, uh, you know, DER recognized there was an issue, it tripped offline. But now it's re-energized and after five minutes, it's going to ramp up. Let's just assume that it wasn't studied in this state, which is pretty common for interconnection studies as to only look at the normal state or the normal configuration of, of the system. Well, now, now it might be causing high voltage. So originally it was at 103 per unit voltage, but let's just assume that voltage went up to 1.07 per unit. Well, what happened there is, is we saw that operating point on this volt watt curve go down from full rated voltage where it was, or full rated power, excuse me, active power generation. And based on the voltage, it, it went down to a, a lower level of generation. So one megawatt plant in this example is now producing 250 kW. And that, that's just an example of, of how this function might might be used. It's sitting there, not activating most of the time, but then if there is some sort of abnormal system condition, it, it's a backup to, to help protect customers on the system from experiencing overvoltage, which might damage their equipment, which is really why we're trying to keep voltage within ranges to start with is that equipment manufacturers are expecting grid voltage to be within that range. They actually have a little bit wider range from the manufacturer's side, but it's based off of the utility range. So we need to be sure to keep voltage within that range so we don't damage customer equipment. And to this question about um, volt watt control, it means reduced generation intentionally sometimes, which means that generation could be curtailed, that, that's absolutely right. Generation could be curtailed and we want to be sure to use the function in a way that it's only for abnormal types of conditions. And this isn't a function that's activated on a daily, weekly, or even monthly type of, of basis.
Um, so that that's it does result in in curtailment, and it's it it's a potential issue. There are there are studies out there that are that are looking looking at the the potential losses here. Okay, and then thinking about how we combine these different functions. So we talked about volt watt and volt var, and, and there's actually a question which is, is more popular, volt watt versus volt var. Well, they, they can actually be stacked on, on top of each other. And, and this is what, what I'm recommending to be considered as an initial approach at least, is that volt var makes a pretty good default function for normal voltage conditions. And so we're just illustrating this on the, the screen by 103% voltage to 106% voltage. We'll loosely call that normal. I know that that's in slight conflict with our previous definition of normal voltage that, that went up to 110%. And we're using it in a little bit of a different sense here. Normal in terms of we want volt var to respond so that there isn't a reduction of active power or losses that the DER might experience that translate into a financial hit, essentially, because they're unable to sell as much energy as they would have if if this volt watt function wasn't wasn't activating. So we would normally want some sort of reactive power function to be the primary response for managing voltage. And we also want the DER to be designed so that it can respond with reactive power without curtailing the, the active power production, which is a slightly separate issue that has to deal with sizing the device to be able to, to do this. And it's a design consideration that, that's made up front when installing the DER, but assuming that it can absorb the requisite amount of reactive power to control voltage without affecting the the um, energy sales component, the active power piece. We would want, want that to be the first response. And then above that, this volt watt, when we're in some sort of contingency condition, that is a good backup type of response. And then if, if the voltage, for whatever reason, the configuration just happens to go above 1.1 1, 1 .1 per unit or 110%, we enter into that ceased energized state or, or the, the voltage ride through functions start to define the response. Um, just looking if there are, there are a number of questions that came in and we might want to address these at break, but let me just see if, um, First question, how could you deal with the reactive power needed due to fault at an inverter side? Um, so maybe a question for the break. Yeah, how about we we take take these at the, the break? I see a number of great questions come in, but um, there's a lot of them. So I, I think maybe I can combine a couple of these with a few minutes to, to look at them. So we're, we're sort of moving Moving out um, of the real reactive control power functions and are going to talk a little bit about responses and power controls. So briefly, DER are required to respond to distribution faults and open up or, or cease to energize and trip within two seconds. And the, the same is, is true for open phase conditions. So if it's a three phase system and one of the phases drops um, to the, the ground, but it's on the utility side, so the DER doesn't see a fault, that'd be an open phase condition. And if it occurs right at the reference point of applicability, then the DER needs to detect it. It's of limited value because it's defined as directly at the RPA. And that's, that's probably not very common for the, the condition to actually occur right, right there. There are power control 
functions. So we, we talked about autonomous control functions that are responding to grid conditions, but there are also commanded power control functions. And this is a little preview of the interoperability module of, of this talk. And I've grayed out the left-hand side because that's not really relevant here, but I would like to point out that there are two different types of information where power controls live in this interoperability interface, and it's this configuration and management settings. And the, the configuration settings allow to basically change the nameplate or not change the nameplate but have an alternative nameplate and that's meant to be perhaps a value that's determined through an interconnection study and then set for the lifetime of the DER. So this isn't really intended to be a mutable or, or dynamic type of setting. It's you set it once and you probably don't change it ever. It, it really modifies the nameplate. It will really only affect the normal operation, so steady state operation, fault current. There's no guarantee that that will be affected by a configuration settings. Management settings, on the other hand, are intended to be changed more frequently, and so these might be controlled by or manipulated by some sort of back-end utility system like an advanced distribution management system or a DER management system where you want to actively change the, the power limit, the active power limit. An example of using this might be, if we think back to that volt watt example where the power was automatically being curtailed, it, it was sort of suboptimal because voltage was still high at, as an end result, well, a backend system might be able to perform analysis on the fly, power flow analysis of what the voltage conditions might be, and send an active power limit in near real time. And the DER must respond within 30 seconds. And that, that could be a, kind of a, a more optimal way of, of controlling the system, but it, it relies on all of these communication systems and backend systems. There's a lot of expense and complexity in building that out. So it's really great to have autonomous functions as a starting point, but then there, there may be the need for these, um, these other, other types of, of functions as well. Putting the, those pieces together, there, there's a hierarchy here of nameplate is sort of the, the device is shipped with oftentimes literally stamped on the side of it or sticker on the side of it is here's the nameplate capabilities of, of this device. This is what it was tested to and out of the box, here's how it operates. The configuration setting could modify that nameplate as, as we talked about. And then the management setting could further reduce the power capability or the power output, I should say, uh, from the configuration setting. So if we look down here at the bottom of the screen, if we're not using a configuration setting, the nameplate really dictates the DER capabilities and the management settings could actively, through a control system, either local or remote, modify the, the power output the active power output. On the other hand, if we are using the configuration settings, that essentially replaces the nameplate ratings. And what the management settings would then be modifying would be starting at that configuration setting point rather than the, the nameplate. So that's sort of how these three different concepts might interact. And it's, it's certainly possible to just implement a configuration setting or just implement a management setting. Uh, but it's also possible to use all three at, at the same time. Looking at how we might use these power controls in a, in a real system, this is an example of a 
fully compliant DER. We'll talk about what that means in the testing context later. But let's, let's just assume that the reference point of applicability is at the point of DR connection or the POC. It's right here where the, the DER units come, come to, together essentially. It's electrically the same, same point as the, the individual DER terminals. Well, the, the configuration setting would change the nameplate of, of each of these, these values. There are sort of these open questions in the standards working group about how we deal with aggregate systems, how we would want a configuration setting to be dispersed across multiple units in a system that contains multiple DER units. I think that's very much a open question and, and there is a lot of active conversation going around that. So I won't dive too deep into that. Um, on the other hand, if a active power limit, and this is the management setting, if that's used, it would modify the, the real-time output. So that's pretty much what we, we just discussed. Configuration setting does nameplate, operational uh, control is through the management setting or the active power. There, there's sort of this nuance in the standard that if your RPA is at the point of common coupling, so this is a, a different for whatever reason, we're assuming now the PCC is, is the RPA at the, the meter, the interface between the grid and the local system. Well, the configuration setting still does the same thing. It, it changes the nameplate, but there, the active power limit now is actually an export limit. So inclusive of the load down here, um, and the load could actually be controlled as part of the DER system to manage that export limit within whatever is it, it's set to essentially. Um, so this is just a, a little bit of difference where there is the ability to use power controls and specifically that management setting of an active power limit for either controlling the output of the DER itself or the export, which is a composite of the generation and the load. And I think we will get into a couple of these questions here. I actually try to answer as, as many of them as, as possible before we move into the, the bulk system support. Um, so let's see, there's a question about, do any of the voltage control functions work better with utilities voltage regulation equipment on the distribution grid or what should be considered? That's a really, really great question. The different functions will interact differently with utility voltage control systems. So the, the ones, the functions that if we're just thinking about reactive power, basically VoltVar is the only one that's actively measuring the utility voltage and responding accordingly. And that's very similar to how all other utility voltage regulation equipment operates, like a voltage regulator or a capacitor. They have a, a PT, a potential transformer or a voltage sensor that's looking at the line and they have a, a dead band and a time delay, uh, very, very similar in concept to the volt bar function. So the volt bar has the highest potential to interact with utility voltage regulation systems. And I, I have seen some research by EPRI and others showing that if settings aren't properly coordinated, if DER volt bar settings aren't properly coordinated with utility voltage regulation settings, the, the DER can actually be trying to control voltage for the entire feeder, and it could prevent load tap changers or uh, more likely a midline voltage regulator from controlling voltage. So the, the DER just keeps on absorbing more and more reactive power up, up to the limit and that may suppress the voltage enough to stop a load tap changer or a, a voltage regulator from operating. Uh, 
But that's probably not what we want from a system perspective because all of that reactive power is creating losses. It's heating up the line, which is reducing the thermal capacity or just the you know, ability to, to transfer useful power, essentially. And, and so that, that interaction, if, if that were to occur, would be undesirable. Um, we would want a regulator to still be able to move and, and really regulate the feeder voltage. And then I'm, I'm seeing the, the DER uh, volt bar function is more trying to mitigate its own impact on the grid and not necessarily try to move the entire grid voltage. So that is one type of, of interaction that we do need to, to watch out for. The other reactive power functions like fixed power factor, it's just really not a, a concern as much because the, the DER reactive power response is decoupled from the grid. It's, it's really only relying on the output of the generator at that time. And that's pretty similar to the um, watt var function as well. That's, it's coupled to the generator output itself. Um, constant power factor is coupled to nothing. It's just a setting, it's a command. Um, so th that's how I look at the reactive power functions is volt var has the most likelihood of, of interacting with the grid. It, it can be managed. We coordinate control systems all the, the time. So it's not, it's not like a reason, I think, to, to not implement Volvar, but it, it's something that needs to be worked through um, as utilities are, are looking at, at implementing that, that function. So I, I sort of went on about that for a while, but I, I think that's a really important question. Um, and, and in terms of, of watt fire, they're just, uh, excuse me, um, volt watt, there they're just aren't really as many grid interactions. So I think we can set that aside. Um, in terms of volt, for volt watt, after reducing the active power, we still have a high voltage was a, a question. And that is certainly possible. That, that was the example that I, I showed and I think that as a, a practical matter, I, I mentioned how messy distribution systems can be. Um, we do unfortunately often accept brief periods of time of low or high voltage, especially during emergency conditions. And there, there is a wider range of voltage within that standard I've been mentioning, ANSI C84.1 has this range B that extends beyond the normal voltage range. And that is to allow for some of these abnormal and emergency conditions. So it certainly is possible. It's something we don't, don't like to see, but the volt watt helps, but it won't necessarily alleviate the condition in, entirely. So that's something to, and a, a keen observation uh, someone, someone made out there. Um, question about if it's a third party system, how do you enforce curtailment and prevent overvoltage scenarios? Well, without direct control of the generation, I guess there's a couple approaches here. One, there are the autonomous functions that are could be agreed upon during the interconnection that could potentially be curtailing or preventing overvoltage through the, the autonomous operation. Otherwise, a lot of these issues are typically done, uh, dealt with in contractual arrangements. So interconnection agreements, operating agreements, maintenance agreements. And um, it can be unique per agreement, but something's agreed upon typically of how a utility, what, what um, a utility's response can be during abnormal conditions or emergency conditions. So it's, it's kind of gets into the contractual realm, which will align with the keeping policy, regulatory uh, market stuff outside the scope. We'll probably just leave it, leave it there. Um, there's another function or another question, excuse me, on regarding the functionalities, Volvar, for example, when you have a DER with many inverters and a common PCC, do you consider that the functionalities are implemented in each inverter or in a centralized plant controller? Great question. Um, that is sort of a, 
underlying implication of the, the standard update and the requirement for having a RPA at the PCC is that if there are multiple DER units, it's almost unavoidable that there is going to need to be some sort of plant controller. There, there have been discussions about that in the standards working group of, you know, we, we didn't explicitly say that plant controllers are going to be required. There might be other ways of meeting it. But from a, a practical standpoint, coordinating multiple DER units with one single RPA that's at the PCC sort of leads to needing a plant controller. And some of the functionalities would likely be implemented in that, that plant controller, uh, at least measuring the conditions that uh, ride through or local system support functions would respond to, um, that, that could definitely be part of the, the plan controller. So that's uh, yeah, a great, great observation and, and something that's likely to be more common in the future. I think a lot of sites, larger PV sites that I've seen are starting that plan controllers anyways for, for other reasons, uh, like ease of updating inverter settings. I, when I was uh, at the utility and, and working on interconnections, some developers didn't do plant controllers. And when there was a setting change and they were string inverters and it's a two, two megawatt plant, they, they might need to go to a hundred different inverters and actually implement those settings. So there, there are reasons besides the standard to potentially have a plant controller on larger systems, but even thinking of, of like a uh, smaller combined DER technologies now, I think plant controllers are going to be much more, more common. Um, another question, in, in reality, how do the distribution system operators tune these volt var and volt lock curves for HDER? Another, another really good question. Um, I think that that's yet to be seen. The, the tools are still evolving to really help grid operators with determining custom settings for each of these functions. So I, I could see there need to be kind of hands-on intricate approach needed if you are going to deviate from the, the default functions for larger systems, if there's some need to do like a customized tuning. I'm not aware of, of really good tools currently that would, would help you determine those settings. But I think that that is an emerging need that will want to refine these curves. But in terms of what's going on today, and especially for smaller systems, I think a lot of them are just accepting the, the default curves. They're fairly grid friendly, for lack of a better term, in terms of like, the the gain or slope of the volt bar curve is gradual enough that it's been shown in studies not to have as many control interactions with other inverters that have volt bar functions or or potentially other voltage control systems. So um, definitely an evolving space, but it it's. It's something that I think at first a lot of grid operators are going to just be going with default values and perhaps tweaking the settings as they come across the need for systems in the field. And as we get better tools for, for analysis for these more dynamic functions, you know, uh, distribution studies have long been done statically at boundary conditions, peak load, peak generation, minimum load, peak generation. You can think of kind of four of those boundary conditions, I, I think we're needing to move to more dynamic analysis to capture these control interactions and to refine settings. So it's, it's uh, definitely an emerging need that, that we're going to, to look at. Another question on uh, what about volt var response for under voltage conditions? We didn't talk about that, but the Volfar curve does respond to inject reactive power, very similar to you know what a capacitor bank might look like from a sort of black box perspective of it's injecting reactive current in, into the the system. And the Volfar curve will very much do the same for low voltage. 
but um, and that that will possibly be activated in in some grid locations, especially if this is a default function. I, I think that will be common. But the the primary impact of DER is to raise voltage, and and so that's why we we sort of focused on the the over voltage. Um, question on how do we handle unbalanced grid voltage regulation problems with inverters? The, the short on that is inverters aren't going to help with that, or at least the standard inverter functions. Three phase inverters are going to have um, an identical three phase response in terms of reactive power injection or absorption. So as a default right now, they're, they're not going to help with the um, grid voltage, an unbalanced uh, phase unbalance at, at least. So, you know, one phase is higher than the other two phases, which is typically a, a sign of uneven loading or, or some, you know, maybe single phase capacitor bank, or there's a number of, of reasons, but in, in short, it just really won't help um, could you repeat the relationship of DER position in the power system in terms of voltage level contribution? So if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, what I was mentioning is that DER that's located very near the source or the substation are going to have lesser impact on raising the voltage compared to, to DER that's very far out on the line. So it's really a function of how much impedance and line has impedance and smaller line has higher higher impedance. So how much of that impedance is between the DER and that very strong system, which is often represented by the substation or the transmission or bulk bulk system level. A question is management setting configuration good enough to replace the need for let's say backflow relays that many utilities are requiring? for systems not allowed to export. Uh, a, a question of, of active debate currently, I can tell you my, my personal view on this is that, that yes, these, these settings will be adequate because they are certified by a national lab. Um, like they'll, for an inverter, this will be a UL1741 tested function. So it will really have been run through the, the paces to be sure that it, it's actually functioning properly. Um, so from, from my perspective, the management setting and that the configuration setting in, in particular is good enough to limit the nameplate value and the management setting in particular is good enough to limit an export value. I, I would say that additional relays on top of that are not needed. Um, but I, I am part of this uh, subgroup of IEEE 1547.2 that, that is really debating this issue. It's the subgroup is focused on active power controls. And so we're thinking through all of the different use cases for using the management and configuration settings. And with this group of utilities, inverter manufacturers, um, advocates, consultants, sort of a wide range of, of stakeholders were trying to come to some sort of consensus on, on that question. Um, and then I'm seeing just one more question here. Would it, would it make sense to widen the dead band farther from the substation if there are multiple systems on a single feeder? So I guess if I'm assuming that this is related to the volt var setting, I have to think about what's behind this question. I, I could, I could see widening out further from the substation based on the. I, I, I might have to, have to actually think through that further. I'm not sure that I have an answer on the fly. I think that there's a little bit more behind this this question. Um, and it might have to do with the interaction between multiple systems and 
I guess what I would say about that is that the default setting and the default bandwidth from the studies I've seen, there aren't a ton of interactions between the, the systems. So um, if, if there's sort of a different angle on this, I'd be happy to um, try to, to address that. So then there's a question about how does an inverter-based DER consume reactive power? Is, is there any reactor connected in parallel to the inverter to facilitate consumption? So it's an interesting question. When, when we talk about absorbing or consuming active or reactive power, what, what we're really talking about is a, a shift in the current waveform compared to the voltage waveform. So it, when, we, when we hear about leading or lagging power factors, you know, that's really what we're, we're talking about is the, the current waveform. If we think about, you know, we have a waveform that's 60 Hertz and there's a zero crossing point um, on, this, on this voltage waveform, where the zero crossing of voltage is compared to the zero crossing of current whether that current crossing is in advance of the voltage crossing or behind it is really what's behind this leading or lagging power factor. And absorption and consumption of bars is, is another way to, to talk about leading or lagging power factors. And reactive power, it, it's not expended like active power is, it's exchanged. So even you know consumption, absorption, injection might be a bit of a, a misnomer. I, I find them to be useful ways to talk about it, but reactive power is really being exchanged between systems and not um, necessarily con consumed. So when we're talking about consuming, we're, we're talking about a shift in the current waveform versus the, the voltage waveform, which is a little bit different than how we think about consuming active power, which is actually used to perform work. And that's less of an exchange. And that's the exchange being more related to reactive um, and active being more related to, to actual consumption. So a good, a good question. And then uh, last question I'm seeing here is, can the inverter have both volt bar and volt watt function at the same time. In other words, when the inverter has volt watt control in place, is the volt bar active? Yes, it's possible to have, oh, okay, let me just making sure. I sometimes see volt um, watt bar and volt watt is the same, but we're talking about one reactive power function and one active power function. So volt bar and volt watt, those can be stacked on, on top of each other. Um, which is different than reactive power functions. We talked about like four different reactive power functions. Those are mutually exclusive. You can only have one reactive power function active, but you are able to stack on volt watt on top of any of those four reactive power functions. So yes, it's, it's possible to have both of those activated at, at the, the same time. And I think we made it through the questions. I apologize if I missed any right now. Um, I would be happy to circle back. Please uh, let me know if I, if I did miss any. I see that we were roughly at another hour here and it's a logical place just to take another quick five minute break before we dive into the, the bulk system function. So getting into ride through, low voltage ride through, high voltage ride through, frequency droop, some of the events on the bulk system recently that have motivated the need to include DER to support the, the bulk system, which is, is really a, a recent development. Um, those are the, the types of topics we're going to talk about and then balancing the bulk system needs with distribution system needs. So I'm seeing 1028 central time. I'm going to be back at 1033. And please uh, feel free to ask additional questions. I'll uh, try to address those at the, the top 
before we dive into the, the next module here on the bulk system support. So thanks again for all the, the great questions. Keep them coming and be back in about five minutes.
All right, we're about to start back up into the, the bulk system. So I hope you had a chance to grab a cup of coffee or take a quick stretch here before we, we dive into the bulk system aspects. So transmission, how DER might affect other bulk system generators in, in tripping. And, and really central to that are the, the ride through um, and frequency responses and, and mandatory tripping of DER, which is, is part of how the ride through functions are, are defined. So I'd, I'd like to, to start by um, showing this figure from a recent NERC report on implementing or adopting IEEE 1547 2018. I think NERC is is very interested in in this from the perspective of really the the writings on the the wall that DER is going to play a larger role in the overall power system, and it has the effect to it has the the ability to affect uh, system stability and reliability. So we need to support the the bulk system if the bulk system goes down there there is no nothing to energize the distribution system so obviously that's really of uh, central importance here but at the same time there are distribution system needs that are sometimes uh in conflict for lack of a better term with the, the bulk power system needs and and that's what this graphic from the the NERC report is is showing that there's there's really this need to balance um, transmission and distribution requirements because the bulk system might want longer trip times for example where distribution might want to trip quicker um, I think that's that really characterizes the the type of tension tension's probably a better word than, than conflict that that are that occurs between transmission and distribution and, and through that emerges this need just to have better or closer coordination. Um, I would like to, to mention that uh, a, a colleague and, and myself wrote a, a recent white paper on this. It was actually just published last week about why utilities really need to proactively engage with guiding DER bulk system responses and, and we point to some of the efforts that have occurred in, in MISO, PJM, New England ISO to start to standardize DER responses. I'll show a couple figures from, from this uh, white paper in, in the coming slides, but just wanted to let uh, folks know that this is available. It's, it's publicly available. Um, you can search for the, the title or uh, the, the links on the the page as well here if you're looking for a little bit more information on this need for coordination and, and the potential tension between transmission and, and distribution. So now getting into a little bit of motivation of, of why, why do we even care about DER being part of the bulk system response? It, it's on the edge of the grid, right? It's not, it's not really going to, to impact these really large generators. And for, for many years, that was that was true. And that, that led to the historic or legacy responses of, of DER tripping offline very quickly for any disturbance. But what we're starting to see is uh, the, the real impact on the system of massive amounts of DER simultaneously tripping. And this event in, in California in 2018, there's actually two events that NERC reported on in uh, January 2019. It's really a great example, I think, of, of a measurable and meaningful impact that DER tripping is having on this, the system. So this is in, in California ISO. There was a transmission event. There were two transmission events, um, a fault on the system, so a, a voltage disturbance and a large amount of both bulk system and DER inverter-based generation tripping, along with the combined cycle power plant. And this was really the first time that there was a appreciable measure of DE, uh, 
amount of DER that, that tripped, 130 megawatts in the first event, uh, 100 megawatts in the, the second event. I think that people suspected that DER was tripping during some of these events, but it, it wasn't really quantified in the past. And what we're looking at here is over 10% of the total PV generation that tripped was on distribution. As we play this out further in time, I think we can see that DER has the potential to really affect system reliability um, and, and stability potentially. So if, if we look at the different responses that um, we talked about earlier for a bulk, bulk system event, this is from that same NERC re report. And I think it does a nice job illustrating at a bulk system level how a large aggregate amount of DER might respond. We have, and, and let me first mention that these these time scales don't match how DER will will operate because um, most of these were were bulk level resources. But what we're we're looking at here is at the left hand side of the screen. Okay, normal normal operations up until twenty seconds. There's an event on the system. Almost everything drops off line temporarily, but there's that very quick restore output response that, that occurs and we get back about half of the, the generation. And then there's about a five minute or there for DER, there would be a five minute delay here. It's, it's a little bit less than a minute where um, units are waiting to start to produce power. So they're, they're sensing the grid conditions, drive normal voltage frequency. Yes, I do. Okay, after a set delay, let's start, start ramping up. So this is how um, modern systems with the restore output combined with legacy systems um, with this delay might, might operate. So we'll, we expect to see a variety of, of responses, but this sort of captures the two main main ones that we might expect to see for a bulk system event. And I'd like to talk a little bit first about how historic voltage tripping requirements were defined in the standard and some of the ambiguity that existed in the previous standard which was further defined in the recent standard. So we'll, we'll first kind of look at legacy and on the very next slide, we're gonna look at how this evolved. In the legacy standard, IEEE 1547, 20, 2003, there was the, the most important region was really this, this must trip and, and clear. That was well-defined. There was one response tripping when you entered that, that region, just, very, very clear. What wasn't as clear is this, this whole entire region to the left, this May trip region. Some bulk system operators interpreted this as a ride through region where the DER wasn't going to, to trip. But in reality, the, the DER had that option. It could trip, it could not trip. It, it was completely undefined. So that, that's a little bit problematic from a bulk system operator standpoint and very problematic from a modeling standpoint if you don't know what the response is for a very wide region. And for a variety of reasons, the, the new standard, IEEE 1547 2018, introduced a little bit more definition around this. And the ride through responses and the defaults and the ranges of allowable settings vary by performance category. So what we're looking at here is a representation of, of category three, the most capable voltage ride through and the only one that has this momentary cessation zone. And there, there was a question on momentary cessation. I'm gonna be sure to uh, get through, yes, what is the difference between momentary cessation and fault ride through is the question we had on the, on the table from a little bit ago. So the, the real difference is the ride through regions are mostly defined by this mandatory operation. 
I guess momentary cessation is a type of ride through response because it's it's staying synchronized and connected. So I, I could see sort of saying that uh, momentary cessation mandatory operation are ride through responses, kind of subcategories of, of ride through. Mandatory operation is sort of exactly how it, it sounds. The DER is required to maintain operation and the exchange of active and reactive power um, similar to the pre-disturbance level. Momentary cessation we talked about is that st stopping the production of, of active power, but staying synchronized to be able to come back very quickly. This continuous operation region in the middle is aligned with that 0.88 to 1.1 per unit that we talked about where this isn't this isn't a ride through region. This continuous operation is normal normal performance. So that's not really part of, of ride through, but we need to represent it here just to say, okay, that's this is normal. Don't take any sort of ride through or mandatory tripping response. And then we still have these these shell trip regions and a may ride through or may trip region, which is that ambiguity that we discussed in the, the previous slide, but I, I think that what's beneficial about this change is look how much we we shrunk that undefined region down. So we have, in terms of the the range of, of responses that we can model or observe from the, these DER, it's it's much more defined than it was in the in the previous standard. These different categories are based off of um, either based off industry sources or industry experience is maybe the broad way to describe them. Category one, which we think of mostly for synchronous machines, um, is based on German grid code. There was a lot of modeling and analysis that that went into um, grid forming these German grid codes. And, and so the IEEE standards adopted that. But what's what's unique about category one is it, it doesn't provide all of the bulk system needs. So if we define all DER as category one, I think we'd be setting ourselves up for bulk system issues in the future. So really we would prefer to wherever possible, go with category two or category three. Category two is based off NERC PRC 24-2, which is the NERC voltage and frequency um, tripping requirements and, and ride through. And, and that really meets all bulk system needs then, including this fault-induced delayed voltage recovery that we'll talk a little bit about. Category three goes even further. It encompasses all of the, the NERC PRC 24 needs, but then it also um, starts to consider distribution system operations and, and potential you know, improving power quality and distribution through these, these types of events. So it's, it goes a little bit further. And then frequency, all of the categories were, were harmonized meaning that there are no differences in the, the uh, default settings, the range of allowable settings for the, the frequency for category one, two, and three. They're, they're all the same. They exceed PRC 24-2, so they, they should really meet all bulk system needs, including for uh, low, low inertia grids. Looking at a, a different ride through profile here. This is for category two. What I wanted to point out here is that instead of that momentary cessation, which we saw down here for category three, it's a, a permissive operation capability, meaning that the, the DER could still produce active active power um, and then 
similarly, we have undefined regions. So kind of toggling to category three, just for a reminder, it had this momentary cessation capability all the way down um, below the mandatory operation. So pretty significant difference in requiring this additional capability of momentary cessation for category three. And something that might be really beneficial. Um, we'll talk about an amendment to the, the standard. Actually, that's the next slide here. The modified category three to potentially make it more useful and palatable for distribution system operators. There were some concerns down, down here, especially with this range of adjustability. So what we're looking at on the screen here is this under voltage, UV2 is an under voltage trip setting. And what the, the standard had before the amendment is that I, I believe it started at five seconds and you could only increase that. So you, you couldn't have the mandatory um, tripping down, down below that. And some distribution system operators thought, well, that's, that's just too long of a time. So we, we'd like to have category three, we like momentary cessation, but we're not sure about this UV2 and UV1 to some extent as, as well. And so there was this amendment, IEEE 1547A, that was fast-tracked to allow for a wider range of settings. It was published just this year, uh, it's a 2020 amendment. and I think that that might allow additional regions. So this is typically done at the ISO or RTO level of um, adopting or modifying the, the default settings. I think that this might allow for additional jurisdictions to adopt category three and some of the benefits that, that flow from it. And an, an example of, of that is, is MISO actually. Um, sort of local to where where I am in the University of Minnesota. Um, they, when they were going through the stakeholder process of trying to select category two versus category three, they, they said, well, if the amendment passes, we would consider category three. Otherwise, we'd like to go with category two. This was prior to, you know, the balloting on, on the amendment. And so it's speculative at that time, but that, that's an example of a stakeholder process that resulted in saying, yes, we like category three, but can can we adjust it a little bit? And those adjustments have been made and that might, might open up others to uh, adopt the category three as well. What's What I find interesting about the stakeholder processes at the ISOs and RTOs to adopt the, the ride through and mandatory trip settings is that Basically, every ISO RTO that's gone through this exercise has modified the under voltage trip settings and they've ended up in different places. So, what we're looking at for the black dots are the IEEE 1547 defaults. And I should mention this is um, category two. And PJM is the, the dark blue, this one, ISO New England, light blue, and then and MISO gray. And so we, we noticed that they're all different. And some of these, like ISO New England, I believe was, was based off of analysis of voltage impacts in the region, PJM might be as, as well. Um, others are, are based off of how uh, equipment is set in that region and operating experience. but. We, we did see a range of different settings being specified or recommended by the ISO RTO when, when going through this exercise. And this graphic is from that um, ICF white paper that I mentioned, and there, there's more details behind this if, if you're interested there. And then just briefly looking at the, the frequency ride through, um, no ISO or RTO has modified the default trip settings for the, the frequency ride through. So this seems to be really pretty straightforward from an implementation perspective of 
all the performance categories are the same in terms of frequency response and the jurisdictions that have looked at adopting 1547 have just gone with the defaults for frequency and I think that's great news from a, a system perspective as well because frequency is a, a system phenomena across the entire interconnect so we have three you know main interconnects in the continental United States the eastern interconnect the western interconnect and then ERCA, Texas is its, its own, the, the frequency is the same in all different points of a given interconnect. So good that we can sort of all agree on, on this, whereas voltage is a very localized phenomena um, in the area that's experiencing a, a disturbance. So there's good reason based on system strength, which affects how um, voltage events play out to have regional differences in the, the voltage ride through and uh, mandatory trip settings. Also related to frequency and uh, something that's been a fairly straightforward implementation is the frequency droop function. Um, this is pretty standard on, on large generators and now it's standard on DER as well and the, the basic concept behind this is that for frequency that's that's increasing so kind of looking at this this chart on the, the right hand side we have a dead band again you know common in most control systems it's right around 60 hertz the nominal frequency of the the system and we're, we're also assuming that prior to the disturbance we're at 60 percent output level so we we have a, a disturbance that starts increasing the overall system frequency the the der response would be to decrease the active power output so frequency from a system perspective is coupled to active power um, oddly enough it's the opposite for the inverter system itself but that's a little bit beyond the, the scope to get into but it's it's something that uh, is sort of a i think counterintuitive phenomena for those of us uh you know that are just really used to active power and frequency being coupled and reactive power and, and voltage being being coupled so increasing frequency decreasing active power output decreasing frequency increasing active power output if the der was operating at 100 percent power output prior to the disturbance it's not going to have the ability to help with under frequency events so it, it does depend on the under frequency side um, what the pre-disturbance output level is otherwise for over frequency being able to to curtail output is something that all DER is, is capable of, of doing. Okay, so that, that gets through the um, ride through responses, both voltage and, and frequency. And now we're going to get into modeling these responses a little bit for the bulk system side. So this is modeling that would occur uh, within transmission studies or ISO RTO studies that need to include DER. So it's not like a distribution study. It's, it's uh, making a composite of the DER on the system for modeling the bulk system response. And that's, that's what we're looking at uh, from this NERC report again is there are really two different types of, of DER that can be modeled within the, the framework and it's the retail DER R or R DER is kind of behind the meter rooftop PV and then utility scale DER and this model shows the connection point of like residential 
DER is included on the, the bus with other motor loads and electronic loads and static loads, whereas the utility scale is sort of modeled separately. In terms of the, the details of the model, and we're not going to go through this control diagram in detail, but I would like to point out some of the functional blocks and point to this NERC report uh, to explain the, the details. But what we are looking at here are um, the, the modeling of reactive power and voltage controls. So kind of the, the volt, hmm, volt bar type of controls, active reactive controls, the, the frequency controls and then frequency tripping, which starts to get at what we were looking at for that California event is that we need to include legacy inverters here somewhere. So, and, and that's dealt with through fractional tripping. So we expect some portion of DER to trip offline because they're under the old standard and they're going to trip off very quickly. And so we need to account for that in the models. That's really what the, the fractional tripping is, is doing there. So I think I'll just leave it at, at that point for this, this model. It's something we could probably spend a lot of time on if, if we, we had the time. And then I, I guess since we, we started this section by talking about, well, there's this tension between distribution and operation. Just to, to make that a little bit more concrete, I'd like to mention a few examples of how ride-through might impact distribution operations. And, and the, one of the first ways is that DER hanging on longer, producing active power into the, the system, can increase the level of incident energy during an event. So if there's, um, the, the events that we're most concerned about is there's somebody in a factory, they're working on, you know, the, the electrical equipment, uh, a wrench falls and causes a, a fault. And there's this flash of, of energy um, an arc flash, it's called, and the the amount of incident energy there is defined by both the amount of current and the the time component. And so, what we're potentially doing here is allowing DER to inject current into the system for a longer duration of time, which could increase the amount of of incident energy. For inverters, it's it's maybe more on the, the margins, synchronous machines, grounding banks, which might not trip off, offline as the DER trips offline. Those are probably um, of higher concern in instant energy, but it is something that needs to be reviewed and studied as inverters are deployed more widely that is there a safety issue? How do we, we deal with that if, if there is? And, you can deal with it on the, the source side by limiting the amount of fault current and the, the time duration, or you can deal with it on the personal protective equipment side by um, just rating your face shield, your, um, your fire resistant clothing at a higher calorie rating is, is how they're rated in terms of, of the amount of energy that they can absorb without um, creating an issue. So kind of both the, uh, a source and uh, receiving side that it can be be dealt with. It's something to be considered. Um, secondly, there are some fast acting controls on distribution. Typically, we like to delay responses a, a little bit. You know, there's not as much of a need to have very fast reclosing as there is on the transmission system due to like system stability considerations as a reason to potentially need very fast reclosing on transmission. 
Well, I, that's not necessarily the need on distribution, but I have spoken with a number of utilities that do reclose distribution feeders. So reclosing is after a device opens back up. Um, is it going to test the system again automatically to see if that fault is still there uh, in order to prevent uh, a utility personnel from going out and and uh, closing it manually, checking out what's on the system. So it, it helps protect reliability on the, the distribution system. But if, if there isn't any delay, if it's very, very fast, there's a potential for a device to reclose in during a ride through event. And there could be out of synchronism types of issues that, that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and then what the final thing I'd like to mention here is that there is some concern about DER not shutting down for grid outages now that it, it has this ride through. But if we think back to that hierarchy of the prioritization of different responses, tripping for faults, open phase conditions, islands, that's required. Uh, ride through doesn't give DER a pass on any of that. So it, it's something to keep in mind that ride through interacts with some distribution aspects, but some of these core safety elements just aren't aren't really affected at all. So I see there's a couple questions here. Um, first one is about a long-term trend in the power production. That's probably going back here. Um, down in the second event. If it's referring to to this, I I don't I don't know what some of these little anomalies are. Perhaps it's described in that that NERC report, but I'm not um, not coming up with exactly what those are right now. So it's a good good question, and I don't have a good answer for you at the moment. Apologize for that. Uh, next question, what level of DR penetration is typically needed before utility or RTO is requiring modeling of DR in their bulk system studies? It's another good question. I, I don't necessarily know. I From my experience working at the utility, the the at the time, the DER was still being modeled as a load modifier. And I think we're, we're just starting to turn that bend where we, we do need to start modeling it separately. This NERC parameterization of the, the DER responses is a very recent development that's been ongoing for a few years. There were a couple prior iterations, but I think it's, it's um, solidified to the point where it will start to be a more common practice. And the, the particular thresholds probably depend on where system impacts are expected to start to occur. So it might might differ as well. Um, question about what issues would a fast reclose have on an inverter-based DER? Um, the, the, I guess the commentary behind the question is that what damage will it cause the DER because the distribution system probably won't be affected for small scale DER. And I, I think that that's, that's right on is that the fast reclose and the out of synchronism concerns. So out of synchronism, we were talking about these voltage waveforms and um, how they're they're all in sync across the system. Well, an out of sync is that the grid side and the DER side, that voltage waveform has shifted. And what out of synchronism reclosing or the effect of out of synchronism reclosing is to have uh, damaging voltage and, and current spikes. So to, to this question of what effect does it have on a small DER, if the power electronics in that, that device aren't capable of, of withstanding the, that voltage spike, there's the, the potential that the inverter could be damaged. Um, and I think that the, the comment on not impacting the distribution system for small scale DER is, is exactly correct. Then another question, do the bulk power system models need the specific inverter settings between say legacy um, amended 2014 
settings and 2018 for individual, what do utilities need to consider about data inputs and assumptions in modeling the various settings? I think that, and, and this is another great question, I, I think that how this is going to be done is to assume that legacy inverters, that there, there's a proportion of 2003 uh, default settings out there. And then the, the specific settings of the, the tripping would need to be modeled. I'm, I'm less clear on the amendment in 2014. So we're, we didn't talk about it here, but there was an amendment to IEEE in 2014 that allowed for voltage and frequency ride through. It didn't, didn't require it, but um, it changed the the settings a little bit, I, I believe, and, and definitely allowed for that wider range of settings so that if uh, tripping wasn't mandatory at these very stringent default values that go back to th 2003. So I, I guess my, my general sense is that the, the individual settings or, or at least a settings profile for each of those different vintages of um, standards is important and then some sort of rough fractional basis that's assigned to each is is important it might be that the 2003 and 2014 amendment get combined to some some level uh, depending on what the expectation is on how different those responses are but it's certainly going to be important to model differences between the 2018 settings, which include these ride-through functions that we're talking about, and the 2003 settings that re require pretty quick tripping. And that looks like all the questions that we currently have. Uh, there's one more actually. Oh no, looks like, looks like some of the questions clear out as uh, as their answers. So, um, now we're going to talk a little bit about emerging bulk system needs. And the, this is both on the distribution and, and transmission side. So we'll talk a little bit of, of both, but I think that even the examples on the um, transmission side illustrate where we need to head with distribution. But there might be good reason, and I think there probably is, to try to move ahead with the, the bulk system um, resource responses in these areas first, just because you, you can get a lot larger response from a large unit, it's less coordination. But the, the concepts are the same across T and D. So there's, there's the fast frequency response, and I don't have it listed up here, but related to fast frequency response is, um, sort of a, some people are calling it synthetic inertia. I, I don't particularly like that, that term, but talking about the, that inertial response that bulk rotating machines give in the very, very quick time scales. So kind of looking behind this fast frequency response um, chart, it's where the, the, um, the, the frequency might just start to fall very quickly. And that's before fast frequency response can kick in is where the inertial component might come in. Um, fast frequency response is a slightly delayed, but not by much. It's still, you know, as the name implies, pretty, pretty fast. Uh, and that's, that's to help recover uh, system frequency. On the, on the voltage side, there may be the need to inject real or reactive power during voltage events to try to minimize the effect and the amount of both bulk system and TER that trip in response to, to voltage events. And then sort of going back to the, the modeling perspective as well. So we've, um, we have models that kind of roughly approximate the high level responses, but what is currently a gap is a, a very, robust approach for modeling the fault current um, characteristics of inverter-based resources with these devices being really uh, software defined. It's 
a very wide variety of responses that we're seeing in the literature in terms of a fault current. So it's a challenge to model and there's a lot of work going on to, to sort of better understand how we could model the fault current. So starting with um, fast frequency response and, and inertial response, why, why do we need this in, in the, the first place? And I, I think it's ERCOT study that uh, is, is referenced on the, the slide uh, and from which this image on the left originates is a, a really good example of how an increase in wind penetration in, in this example, assuming that uh, a significant proportion of this wind generation is electronically coupled at higher penetration levels, we're seeing a, a downward trend in, in the, the system inertia, which is represented on the, the y-axis here. And we're, we're seeing over time as well that year over year, it looks like this is you know, start, starting to, to decrease even, even further. And the reason that this is important is if there, there isn't much system inertia, when there, there is some sort of event, a frequency event, the, the lower the system inertia, the quicker the frequency will fall and the further it can fall as, as well. Um, so we, on this right-hand side of the screen, we're looking at a curve. The blue curve shows a, a stable frequency response. Maybe we had inertial response kick in and in this time zone and then um, well, the, the time scales are, are quite delayed here on the bottom so I wouldn't pay too much attention to, to those but um, secondarily the the fast frequency response could help stabilize the the system so that's it's really why we are talking about fast frequency response and um, inertial response is that the the higher levels of penetration could cause system instabilities if if this isn't isn't addressed and um, my experience is more on the the distribution side so there there are probably people on the the line that have a lot deeper experience on this bulk system stability um, concept and would welcome any any other thoughts there another study that came out recently was from MISO looking at the, the need for fast frequency response at, at higher renewable penetrations. And what was studied here was a, a few different thresholds of renewable penetration, 20, 30, 40, 50. What we notice is that at 50%, we start to have a, a serious frequency problem where we dip below the under frequency load shedding threshold. So um, utilities set up protective relays to start dropping load below a certain frequency to try to arrest that, <clears throat> excuse me, that frequency fall. And it's something that we, we want to avoid. We don't want to shed load due to a system event. We'd rather stabilize the system through other means. So approaching this under frequency load shedding threshold is a definite system problem. What MISO looked at was that there were a couple different technologies that could contribute to resolving this, this issue. The first could be introducing additional headroom into conventional generation and then also uh, wind and, and PV plants. So headroom would be the, the concept of having the ability to increase active power output. So reserving some level of active power output. The other means was a, a fairly large amount of energy storage. And through the, the combination of, of those technologies, it, it was found that the, the frequency event and avoiding dipping below that under frequency load shed threshold, that, that could be accomplished. Moving on to dynamic voltage support, and here's where we're going to talk a little bit about that fault-induced delayed voltage 
recovery that that I mentioned in an earlier slide. That's one of the driving reasons for wanting to have this dynamic voltage support. But but also another key reason is to prevent legacy DER from from tripping. So let's let's reduce that amount of of fractional tripping that we were talking about from the the units that were based on the the 2003 standard. But uh, first, I'd, I'd like to look at the, the bottom of the screen here, which is showing a voltage event, how, how the, during a fault, which is represented in the middle of that red circle, how the low voltage will propagate out from that, that center of the event. And the, that boundary of, of DER tripping is intended to represent where DER is at, at risk of tripping versus where DER is expected to, to stay online. And what we're really trying to do with dynamic voltage support is reduce that area where DER might, might be tripping in order to try to maintain system stability, reliability, keep as much generation on, online. If we can prevent DER from tripping, that causes a bulk system plant to trip. That's sort of the type of cascading issue that we're looking to avoid. So that, that's really why we want to try to minimize the extent and the severity of low voltage events and dynamic voltage support. And we'll look at what this actually means. It's, it's really injecting real or reactive current how that can help accomplish this. But um, first I'd, I'd like to look at this fault-induced delayed voltage recovery since it is one of the, the driving forces of, of why we would potentially want to have this dynamic voltage support. So it's, it's this image up, up here now on the, the upper right-hand side of the screen. We have some sort of event, a fault on the system that reduces the voltage, that's this point 0.1. And if we are experiencing a fault-induced delayed voltage recovery event, which is that dark red line, we will have motors start to stall. So motor starts to, to stall, it draws additional reactive power as it, it stalls, drawing that additional reactive power in turn presses the voltage down or prevents it from, from rebounding. And, and so it, it's, that's sort of the, the mechanism behind is these inductive loads reacting to low voltage by drawing additional reactive power and making the low voltage event even worse. And what we see from this curve is that it can take longer for voltage to recover back up to that normal level. And then depending on how long that event was, there could be voltage overshoot here at point number three which then takes time to step back down because voltage regulation devices typically have substantial delays, 15 seconds, 30, 60, 90 even might be common for voltage regulators that are far out on a, a distribution line. So it's, it's both having voltage low for too long, which could exasper cause tripping to get, get worse. And then also um, that rebound and recovery that causes over voltage after the event is why we really want to avoid this um, FIDVR and why we might want to have dynamic voltage support. But there are also some potential distribution system risks. And this is very much aligned with what we, we talked about of injecting additional real and reactive power into the system during a fault. There's that, that list of, of issues or potential issues that could be manageable, but just need to be considered um, as we're thinking about how this function should respond. And what's currently being considered in some of the industry working groups are to have a region that potentially real and reactive power is, is required or allowed or define what that response might look like. And then there's a region where potentially reactive power might, 
be required only. And the idea is at these lower voltages, load might start to trip. Um, and at these higher, you know, relatively higher, still below the continuous operating region, uh, motors might start to, to stall. Kind of turning this into a little bit more, more con concrete there, um, of a concept, there, there was this case study performed by California ISO fairly recently that looked at how voltage control might be able to keep additional DER online. So I have some, some details in bullet points of what the, the study actually looked at, not going to, to cover sort of the characteristics of the, the line and the load and all of that that's displayed on the, the screen. But what I, I do want to mention is this very last row of the table that's, that's highlighted, looking at the reduction of, of DER output in relation to these categories at the top that look at category two or category three DER and with and without voltage control. So I, I think a key takeaway from this is that category three is effective at, at keeping additional DER online and also voltage control is, is effective. So the, the best case scenario for losing the least amount of, of DER here at 0.1% is category three with voltage control. On the other hand, category two, no voltage control, we're at almost a, we're at a full order of magnitude higher in terms of the, the DER that's, that's lost. Now, granted these numbers are still relatively small in the, in the scope of things. I think as this progresses out in time, this is the type of motivation that, that says we should be looking at category three and voltage control, at least from a bulk system stability standpoint. And then finally, before we take another quick break here is the fault current characterization. Um, going back to IEEE 1547 again, this is an improvement I think that it requires three phase oscillographic voltage and current data for the larger DER units defined at uh, 500 kVA and, and greater. And we talked about why that's important before because there's a very wide range of responses. I'm showing just one response over to the, the right hand of the screen, but this probably isn't the strangest waveform. I've, I've seen some of them don't even really resemble uh, what we think of as, as like a sinusoidal uh, looking waveform at, at all anymore. So it's, it's great that larger DER will be required to start to provide this data. I think that will build the body of um, information in the, the industry so that we can start to better understand what these responses look like. And then there's other efforts underway through IEEE P2800, which is a inverter based resource standard for the, the bulk system that's looking at advancing these, these requirements and our understanding even, even further. So with that, I think we're at a good place for a quick break and please ask any additional questions you might have. Um, and I will try to, to address as many as possible when, when we return. And then the next on our, our, our next stop here is the interoperability module that starts to talk about sort of the communication aspect of networking these devices and, and what that, that starts to look like. So we'll come back at, I have 1127 on my machine here. So I'll plan to come back at 1132 central time. And again, welcome, welcome the questions. I really appreciate sort of the, the interactive nature here. This is, this is really helpful. So thank you.
All right. Let's get started again. And thank you so so many of you for sticking with, with me. I know this is sort of a long, long webinar and uh, dense material. So I'm really happy to see there are still a lot of a lot of folks on the line here. Um the the final stretch here, and, and this may be where we need to to leave it after getting through interoperability um, and not getting into the planning operational aspects as much just based on on time and all of the great questions which I would continue to to welcome um, interoperability may be our our last topic here so we'll try to get through this I think it's really key as we think about optimizing the use of of der and coordinating for the the grid that has very high penetrations of, of der this is going to be needed. So defining and building in capabilities today to allow for these future use cases, even if we don't install communications to the device immediately, we will know that any of these standard devices could be networked at some point in the future by installing communications. And then it's a standardized interface that, that we were talking about. So when, when we, Talk about the, the interoperability interface for IEEE 1547. It, it's actually a, a fairly narrow scope. I tend to think of it as basically just like a port on the, the DER is where, where that ends. And so that, that's what we're looking at here is there's this local DER communications interface or a physical port with information requirements behind it that's that's really the, the scope. Everything else, this network interface device that we're showing here, which might be like a cellular modem, um, if it's a cellular network, that entire network, the back end, a network adapter and the uh, kind of all the way to the control system. That's all out of scope for the, the standard. It's really just at, at that DER interface. Um, so then getting into use cases for interoperability. So why, why would we want to have this capability? monitoring of real-time status and, and sort of what's sometimes being called situational awareness is, is really important as the power flows get more complex so we could have overloads or high voltage in areas that we didn't expect before so having visibility into that being able to remotely modify settings so we talked about modifying a power output from a derms system that could be done through the interoperability interface or incorporating into advanced distribution management voltage optimization or fault location or, or other types of, of use cases. There are really four different types of DER information that's required to be exchanged and it, it's standardized. These are standardized parameters and standardized information models. The first is, is nameplate information, so just basic machine or device information. It's a read-only quantity. You can't manipulate it. If you do want to change the nameplate, it's that configuration value that we discussed earlier is to be used as that alternative nameplate. Monitoring points, just to simply look at the status of voltage or power output or the connection or if there's alarms is, is another requirement. Then finally that management information which includes the power controls we talked about but it it also includes all of the volt bar settings, all of the ride through settings. So it's basically everything else that any type of function that you might want to modify it's it's parameter it has parameters in the information model that a person or a system could could modify. In terms of protocols or the language that's spoken by inverters, there are really three different application 
layer protocols, DMP3, SEP 2.0, and SunSpec Modbus. Those are the, the three options a DER is required to support one. It could support all three if, if um, the vendor or manufacturer decided to, to do that, but it needs to support at least one. And it might not be the same one that the utility system is speaking. So I think that there's going to be this emerging need for protocol translators to translate between these, these different protocols at different points of the system. That's the, the application layer um, typically referred to as the, the protocol. There's a, a transport layer that's TCP IP, kind of similar to you know, internet protocol. And then the physical layer, what does that actual port look like? And it's a ethernet port like you might see on your um, router or your, your modem at home. Information models are, are needed to structure all of these different data points in a way that different systems would be capable of exchanging information. And, and so this shows like a common information model data exchange bus that could facilitate this information amongst the, the different systems that might um, want to use it. Then in, in terms of the, the different communication links and the, the different protocols that, that might be used, there's a, a pretty wide variety of, of how these could be configured. Starting at the, the top of the figure on the, the right with the utility SCADA, that shows a link directly between the SCADA system and a utility scale DER using DMP3, which is a protocol that a lot of utilities currently use to control field automation devices, so like reclosers in the, the field, um, even capacitor control sometimes are, are DMP3. So that's a, a very common protocol for utility scale systems that direct link may make a lot of sense. This is something that's actually done today already. If we're starting to think about smaller DER or aggregators, that might change how we, we approach this. In that case, the, the link from the utility system, here we're showing a derm system, but we're just saying it's some sort of backend system. That could really use any protocol to get to the gateway device or the, the aggregator. But then it's, it's pretty well established that the SunSpec Modbus is the protocol that's most supported by the, the DER itself. So we would expect to see in terms of like local communications protocols, SunSpec Modbus is, is going to be very common. Um, IEC 61850 is mentioned here. That's not one of the standard protocols that's, a lot, that's required in the standard, but it would be allowed potentially by, by mutual agreement. Um, it just wasn't ready for DER when the standard was being developed, but I could see that being uh, involved in the, the next iteration of, of the, the standard development or revision, I should say. And then um, IEEE 2030.5 or SEP. 2.0 is the, the standard requirement in California for all DER. And I, I guess the backstory I've heard on that is it was a lot driven by communicating with aggregators. Um, so that was sort of a key consideration of why SEP 2.0 or the IEEE 2030.5 was, was chosen um, for that link between the, the DER utility system and aggregators or between a gateway and and aggregators. So just wanted to point out that um, even though there are only three protocols defined, the decisions and how the different communication links are architected uh, could play out in a, a very wide range. And then it's, it's difficult to talk about interoperability without at least mentioning cybersecurity, which is a, a growing concern. Um, what I'm showing here is that Data is a little bit dated back to uh, 2014. This is from the um, Idaho National Laboratory, uh, a report by, by DOE. Uh, but essentially the, the energy system is, is under attack uh, from cyber intrusions. And, and I think that those of us working in this space sort of intuitively 
know that, but this puts some numbers behind that in terms of all of the different sectors uh, being attacked or, or that face cyber intrusions, at least for this reporting date, that energy was the second biggest target. And roughly half of these incidents were classified as advanced persistent threats or you know, sophisticated actors. So that could be state-based um, actors, you know, other, other countries. And thinking about the resources that they have to uh, devote to the, these types of activities, this, this could be a pretty serious issue. And, and especially thinking about like aggregators and these single points of entry that could control a, a lot of different DER, that, that starts to look a lot like a bulk system plant and an attack on a bulk system plant. And so it's it, cybersecurity and building that in into kind of every every step of the way is is going to be quite important as, as we move forward here. And what I'm I'm showing here is is just a sort of range of different cyber intrusions, impacts, threats and attacks, essentially. Um, just to, to show that there's there's a wide range. Some could be just confidentiality based and, and some actually could cause uh, integrity issues. So like someone actually controlling the system, like I, I mentioned. And, and so we need to be aware and uh, finding ways to stay ahead of attacks in, in all, of, all of these different areas. Okay, so um, I think that what I'll, I'll do here, there's, there's a question, there's a couple questions. I'll, I'll try to answer those quick. And then I have like three or four slides on implementation of, of all of these different functions, how that's going to play out. And I'll probably leave about five minutes for questions at the end. And I, I believe that we're, we're scheduled to end at, at noon here. So we'll be sure to, to try to stay on, on track with that, that timeline. Um, there was a question going back, so I apologize for not answering this earlier at the, the break, but there's a question about in, injecting power during the dynamic voltage support conversation. And, and what we were talking about injecting into is really the, the electric system. So injecting in at, at any point is going to help to some degree. Um, there's a request for a list of papers that deal with uh, the response of, of DERs based on the, the guidelines of IEEE 1547. I think that NERC is probably one of the better sources for that right now. So looking at that spider working group that was mentioned or any of the, the reports that um, NERC's been putting out, they've had a lot of focus on DER impacts and um, they've involved a very wide range of, of folks from EPRI, National Labs, utilities, ISOs, RTOs. So I, I think that those have a pretty good good view that, that could be a reference. And then um, the last question I'm seeing here is what is the impact of DER in terms of harmonics? I would just say that there are harmonic requirements. There's a whole power quality section in 1547 that we're just not going into based on time and that includes uh, harmonics, voltage, steady state voltage, voltage fluctuation, DC injection, I'm sure I'm missing something there, um, consecutive event ride through, so like uh, kind of consecutive events, brief events that don't qualify for tripping. So a number of different uh, topics addressed in power quality including harmonics and uh, the harmonic section is somewhat related to IEEE uh, 519, which is the recommended practices for harmonics. There are some changes in uh, kind of moving to a, a current harmonics-based viewpoint, um, which gets at the DER contribution to harmonics and not the result, which are voltage harmonics. So again, the way that I generally view harmonics is current injection of harmonics so at frequencies that are multiples of 60 hertz. Um, injection of that current causes the, the voltage um, harmonic issue. So 
inverters have come such a long ways from the early days that it's, it's not typically an, an issue, but it's, it's still something that's, that's required. And then um, when talking about active power curtailment in volt watt, but the inverter principle is decoupling um, QV and WF, how can we consider both concepts together? I am not sure I understand that question, so I apologize for that. Um, if, if you have a clarification, I'd be happy to uh, try to address that. Then the, the final one I'm seeing here is, is there any standard communication architecture and protocol for various devices in island microgrids that can be used for a test bed? Want to work on secu cyber secure microgrid? Mm -hmm. It's another really good, good question. I, I think that using the standard protocols, some of which have cyber or have security elements built in, I, I have a slide on that, but ended up moving it to the appendix and in terms of time. Um, I think using standard protocols is a good start. There are a number of different architectures out there and, and frameworks for cybersecurity, like NIST has a cybersecurity framework. Um, there's a number of others. I, I might start with, with NIST as um, uh, an entry point and, and maybe branch out from there. Then in term, uh, another question on whether interoperability requirements specify the type of communication medium? Um, the short answer is, is no. It's, it's, uh, the standard is agnostic in terms of the actual communication medium that's completely out of scope. So it could be DNP3 over fiber optic, it could be over cellular, same for the other protocols, that's just out of, out of scope. Um, and then another question, how difficult is it to get a commercial DER model in short circuit software for analysis. I would say based on experience, very, very difficult. Um, it depends on why you're asking. And if, if you know, I've, I've seen the situation where sometimes this is provided is it's a utility that's asking for that model. And there's a developer sort of stuck in the middle because they're trying to install a system. And so the developer is a customer to that inverter manufacturer, and then they might, you know, require a non-disclosure agreement and potentially um, give a model. But in, in my experience, it's been very difficult to get models, accurate models from the inverter manufacturers because they're concerned about intellectual property. And then a uh, question about reference papers to address harmonic issues in 1547. I don't know that I can point to any specifically. Um, my general sense and my experience has been that I just haven't seen very many harmonics issues with, with DER recently that isn't related to like some sort of resonant harmonic condition on the system. So yeah, there's some level of harmonics, maybe the DER is contributing, but it's really a, a resonant type of issue that maybe there's a capacitor bank. You know, re resonance is sort of like tuning your radio. You, you know, radio is a circuit that tunes and amplifies a certain frequency. Resonance on the electric system can operate uh, pretty similar. So th that's where I've, I've seen, you know, in sort of my, my experience working on the grid, these harmonic issues. Otherwise, it just hasn't really cropped up. And it was a fairly straightforward conversation in IEEE 1547, 2018, when we were um, developing the, the standards. So important, but it, it seems to um, move to the margins a little bit more now that inverter technology has moved along. And maybe I can just explain a little bit more what I, I mean by that. Um, some of the early inverter technology used line commutation, it was called, to turn on the various devices within that inverter. So they basically act as on-off switches, these power electronic devices within the inverter. And what was causing those devices to switch before was actually the grid frequency. And through just how that system operated, that could create harmonics issues. And that was actually more common back in those days. Now that we've moved to really microprocessor, based systems, it's, it's 
not an issue as much. That's not to say that certain manufacturers, you know, could cause harmonic issues, but it, it is a type tested UL certified type of function um, as well. Again, that's of limited value because the grid interaction does ultimately play into what the resulting harmonics are, but it, it just seems to be um, potentially less of a, an issue. So I'm going to move on into this implementation phase and then still try to, to end on time here. Maybe we'll have uh, time for an additional question or two. But we, we talk a lot about the, the standards. So I'd, I'd also like to talk about how this actually turns into real installations in, in the, the field and, and sort of the, the timeline for that. And I, I think I'll probably just, um, yeah, I'll go over this one pretty quickly that we talk about 1547's the base standard. It defines requirements. 1547.1 is a test standard to verify uh, conformance with the, that base standard. We talk some about UL1741. This is specific to inverters, but it, it um, codifies the 1547.1 test procedures and uh, add some safety elements on top so that a nationally recognized testing laboratory, which is a designation that OSHA gives, and there's a, just a handful of them out there, so that one of these NERDLs, as they're called for short, can uh, perform the, the tests. And then state standards would adopt this sort of standards framework and say, okay, we're just going to follow this for all DER installed. And then finally, the um, interconnection, individual interconnection agreements, operating agreements would um, define that, that that's what needs to be followed for a specific installation. Looking at the standards adoption timeline, we're, we're sort of where the star is right now. Mentioned that uh, 1547 is a 2018 standard. The amendment uh, came out in 2020. We're expecting this dot one test standard to be published in, in 2021. This, this should probably say to be published, expected in 2020, just to be clear, but it is fully approved. So that, that allows UL 1741 to start their revision process, maybe late this year. That might be a little aggressive. It's probably into early next year by this point. And then equipment availability, it'll take some time for manufacturers to change over their, their lines. And so that could be another six, nine months, maybe a year. And then in terms of, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of settings here. Someone asked about uh, customized setting profiles. How are utilities going to determine this? There's sort of a hierarchy and this is um, somewhat of an adaptation of a framework that EPRI has, has put together that looks at trying to use the national standards profile as much as possible, as much as that makes sense for a given region, modifying that with what the ISO RTO needs for like ride through specifically is what the regional profile is meant to represent. And then utility specific profiles, they might wanna make minor tweaks, especially to the local system support functions, maybe the, the ramp rate of how, how quickly a unit returns to service. And then kind of getting that question that someone asked earlier about how is the utility going to determine like and tune settings for individual units? I sort of think that that's for large DER to start with since it will be a little bit more of an involved um, process. And we, we talked about some of the, the tools. Um, so that, that's sort of my view on how this could be adopted. And um, I, I'd like to think that it really makes sense to start on the ride through responses right right now before equipment's available. I mean, as much of a strategy that can be developed of how these will be adopted and implemented before the equipment's available really helps. And um, Minnesota, through some of the, the leadership of the commission and, and staff has, has really um, in, embraced getting ahead of this. And I, I think that it's a great model for, for other, other states. Um, to, to potentially look at of now is the time to, to start figuring out how we want this equipment to go into the, the field. And ride through is a great place to start because it can be a little bit more involved with stakeholder discussions. And it's, it's one of the more complex elements 
and then adopting real and reactive power control functions could be considered around the, the same same time. Maybe those are looked at in, in concert, like we talked about with that uh, stacking. And then um, interoperability and communications is potentially a later type of um, a type of issue to to address. Um, I think that we're we're down to just a couple minutes here, and so to to be sure that we end on time, I'll, I'll just look and see if there are any additional questions and then hand it back over to Professor Mohan to uh, wrap us up here on, on time. So um, there was a question about how much the inverter control parameters set by the manufacturer match with the exact PCC X over R ratio for voltage control. So yeah, it's, it's a great question. The effectiveness or voltage control response that can be anticipated from inverter an inverter is really dependent on the system X over R ratio. So that's sort of the, the tie. It's not necessarily, from my perspective, matching inverter X over R, um, but I guess the question is about control parameters. So that's, it's, it's a great point, and that gets to the customization of settings only using reactive power where it really makes sense, and otherwise there might be other voltage control methods. So. I, I usually do try to point out that importance of the X over R ratio um, in talking about grid impacts. So I appreciate someone bringing that up because it is really key to how effective reactive power controls are. Then I, I guess the, the final question here before we wrap up is, are the, is there any requirement of standardizing the fault characteristics for inverter manufacturers? I don't know. It's, it's a great question. I, I think that that could be something that's looked at. The phase that we're currently in seems to be just trying to understand what these responses are and understand why they are what they are. And then potentially the next phase would be talking with inverter manufacturers if there is some way to generate a more standardized type of, of response. So I, I think that's probably where we need to, to leave it here. As you can see, we, we could probably talk about this all, all day and be happy to, to dive in um, further when, when there's another chance, but uh, really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to speak with you all. And again, wanna really thank the University of Minnesota and, and their partners for, for making this, this possible. It's, it's been really enjoyable from my perspective. I hope that you've uh, been able to pick up a thing or two. And, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Professor Mohan. Okay, well, thank you so much, Patrick, for educating us on this very important topic. Uh, you know, DERs would be, uh, they are in our future. We'll see more and more of them. So how do we interface them? And uh, like I learned from your previous presentation that I could already bring this into our own research in terms of the different power electronic topologies. Uh, that's my area of research. And uh, if they could have built-in storage, uh, which will be good for their topology, but it'll also be you know, helpful in terms of providing the synthetic inertia. So, you know, that's something which uh, immediately came, to, uh, you know, in the forefront uh, for us. Uh, so I think, uh, thank you to all of you who took part in this uh, wonderful webinar. And, uh, you know, we hope to uh, arrange other such webinars and uh, I'll be sure to send you that link. And uh, so have a good, rest of the day and please stay safe. Uh, my wife and I, we are in a high risk category. So we are locked up and we are not going anywhere. So, uh, so take care and have a good day. So thank you again very much, uh, Patrick. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye. And thank you all to, thank you to uh, Dan Kelly and Jairam as well. Bye-bye.